When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, Unshaken Saints. Jared Halverson here. Glad to have you back for more scripture study. For you who are new to the channel, if you want to click on the subscribe button and then hit the little bell next to it, that'll give you notifications whenever a new video comes out and you won't miss a thing. And to any of you who like or share or comment or uh, rate the podcast or anything like that, thank you for interacting with the channel. It does help move things forward and get it out to other people. In fact, it's in hopes of doing even more of that that I've enlisted the help of my daughter. She is a young single adult and she knows her generation well and always warns me that a two or three hour video is a non-starter for most of my generation. So let me help you. Uh, and she's going through the videos and trying to pull out briefer segments that can become little standalone shorts on YouTube or Instagram or TikTok if we can get that far. Uh, so that's her pet project try to try to help the, move, the work forward. Uh, and so if any of you want to check out, it's called Becoming Unshaken. And if you want to look it up and subscribe to it or follow it on Instagram or Facebook, I think Twitter, I think she's even starting, uh, that would do a lot to, for her to help uh, her work and, and to move things forward like that. Uh, it's a great opportunity to try to engage other people in learning the gospel. And even if a short three or four minute segment of a video helps whet their appetite for deeper understanding of the scriptures, or maybe, che maybe checking out these longer lessons, then I'm all for it. And we could use your help on that. So Becoming Unshaken, check it out on the other platforms. Now, uh, today we have, uh, again, we have our work cut out for us. Uh, we, we talked about, we created heaven and earth last week, and today we have to we have to accomplish the fall of humanity. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I actually wanted to start by, uh, as many of you know this, when, when my family was young, uh, we lived in Tennessee. We, we were there in Nashville for eight years when my kids were little. Uh, we, we always joked that our job was to put a Book of Mormon buckle on the Bible belt. And we did our best. Uh, but we loved our time there, especially among, among just wonderful evangelical Christians. And we learned, because of the age of our children, that the best preschools were ones run by other churches. So our second son, we had, we had enrolled him in a preschool run by the Church of Christ, which was wonderful. And I remember one day he came home. Bible study was part of the day, okay? And I loved that. But he came home one day with his little illustrated Bible. And it, it, toting it under his arm, he came home and he said, Dad, and he looked really serious. And he said, i got to read my Bible so Jesus can save me. And I just laughed, and I'm like, hallelujah, son. I got myself a little born-again Mormon on my hands. This is great. Uh, well, he loved his Bible study, but I remember one day he came home, and this time he had kind of a, a scared look on his face, and he said, Dad, because I'd always ask him, so what did you learn in Bible study today? And he'd say, Dad, Eve did a bad thing. And I just smiled, and I thought, ah, you talked about the fall today. Well, this is a good chance to correct some false doctrine. Let's talk about the fortunate fall, shall we? And so my son and I went through and talked about the fact that Eve had not made a bad choice, that she had made an incredibly courageous one, that it moved God's plan forward. Downward, yes, but also forward. Orson F. Whitney, remember the Quorum of the Twelve years ago, said that the, the fall had a twofold direction, downward and forward, that it set man's foot upon progression's highway. And so, yes, we have to grapple with the downward dimension, but it's the forward thrust of the fall that I find so important. In fact, uh, perhaps as a way to introduce the material today, let me back up and give you something big picture. As many of you know, I work a lot with people that are struggling in their faith. My PhD was in anti-religious rhetoric, so I studied for years how people lose their faith, and my hope was to help people regain it or, or navigate those faith crises themselves. And whatever their question might be, I'm happy to go directly to their question, but there are two bigger picture items that I almost always bring up with them. One is stages of faith, and the other is proving contraries, which we've talked about uh, both last week and the week before. We'll probably talk about it frequently. We'll, we'll hit it again today. When it comes to stages of faith, though, there's a lot of uh, scholarly literature on human development. And it started 
uh, years ago with cognitive development, kind of psychologically and sociologically, of how do children grow up and progress and see the world. And, and then in 1981, there was a Methodist theologian in, in Georgia that wrote a book called Stages of Faith. So he took like that cognitive model of stage development and christened it, uh, turned it into faith. And how does, if this is how children grow up and view the world, well, how do children grow up and view the church or view the life of faith? Uh, that was 81. In 2015, a Latter-day Saint, who was an expert on stage models, uh, Thomas McConkie is his name, wrote a book called Navigating Mormon Faith Crisis. And he took Fowler and basically baptized it uh, and, and saw this faith model or this stage model of faith, and what would that look like for a Latter-day Saint? Especially one who seems to be struggling in their faith and feels like they've lost it. It's a great book. Then in 2019, Elder Brucey Hafen and his wife Marie wrote a book called Faith is Not Blind. It was actually built on 40 years of work because back in 1979, Elder Hafen gave a talk called Love is Not Blind. And it wasn't romance he was talking about. It was about faith crisis and how to deal with ambiguity and doubt and so on. And then 40 years later, love is not blind becomes faith is not blind. But it's a stage model as well. He talks about simplicity, complexity, and then on to simplicity on the other side of complexity. And it's a great approach to navigating these things because it's in that complexity stage that things seem to fall apart. In fact, all of those, Fowler and McConkie and Hafen uh, and others, it always seems to boil down to three main stages. The first, everything is simple and straightforward, crystal clear. It's, a great, it's important for children to start in that stage because it lets them feel secure and safe in the world around them. And so in stage one, your parents know everything. And doctors can always make you feel better. And politicians are true statesmen that can always be trusted. And if it's on the internet, it must be true and so on. You get the, you get the idea. Well, we typically grow out of that stage uh, and go into stage two where things get a lot more messy. Uh, yes, we're more open-minded in many ways, but we're also more skeptical and sometimes even cynical. Uh, if I'll give you an example. In stage one, parents know everything. Well, in stage two, parents are idiots. Do any of you have teenagers that are now in stage two? Probably. Because uh, usually it hits in teenagehood or early young adulthood. That's when most people go into that second stage. And parents don't know what, don't know what they're talking about. And doctors, diagnostics is just guesswork. And politicians, oh, they're just in it for themselves and they're corrupt. And the internet can't be trusted at all. It's all fake news. And, and so you hit that stage two pretty hard. Now, unfortunately, a lot of times people stay in stage two, not knowing that there's a stage three ahead. And stage three is when things kind of fall back into place. You're not, you've outgrown the naivete of stage one, but you've also matured beyond the cynicism of stage two. And so stage three is a much healthier place to stay. Uh, what ends up happening is child, children who grew up thinking parents were perfect and then thought their parents were idiots finally come through on the other side, often when they have children of their own, and realize, you know, my parents weren't perfect, but they did the best they could and they did have my best interests at heart. And no, doctors aren't omniscient, but they are incredibly well-trained, and I can get second opinions, and, and where else am I gonna go? And no, politicians aren't always perfect either, but there's checks and balances in the government, and, and I can be an informed and engaged citizen and try to make a difference. You understand what I'm getting at? This, this third stage is the best place to be. Now, I've done a lot of study through that, those stage models of development. And to me, the greatest breakthrough came with, with a simple whisper from the Spirit that said, Jared, you've understood these things a long time. It's just creation, fall, atonement. And then the light bulb came on for me and I realized that is the stage model. It's the pillars of eternity. It's the story arc of life. I mean, that's the plan of salvation, creation, fall, atonement. And that's stage one, stage two, stage three that in the creation stage, in Eden, things are so simple. It's a wonderful place, it's just very secure, right? The animals come to you to be named. You eat whatever fruit you want. Everything is wonderful. No sin, no sorrow, no death, great. You just can't stay there forever. And typically you outgrow Eden and move on to this second stage. In fact, it usually comes when you partake of the fruit of knowledge. Not just good and evil, but you just learn and realize Oh, my view was important for its time. It's just a little close-minded or it's a little simplistic and it's time to grow into the next stage. 
Now, that doesn't have to be angry, although sometimes, sadly, it is. The fall stage is where things fall apart, especially when you only can look backwards at creation and cannot yet look forward to atonement. You see, what ends up happening in the fall stage, first, you tend to look back at creation with, with nostalgia. You think, oh, I wish I still felt like I did on my mission. I wish I still had the testimony of my youth. Sadly, the nostalgia can't last very long, and so often it turns into bitterness. Do you have friends or family members that have left the church and they're in that stage? They're in the fall stage and they're angry, and they're, they, they don't like anything about the church. They have mean things to say about it. They feel like they've been lied to or betrayed. Or It's this sense of, oh, great, yeah, God sets me up for this with these contradictory commandments in Eden, and then he sets up cherubim, the flaming sword, just to keep me out, so now I'm stuck. Ooh, there's some anger there. There's some bitterness. Until they come to realize, yes, there's no going back, but there is going forward. And the atonement stage far surpasses the elevation of Eden. You just can't go straight from Eden to atonement. You have to pass through the valley of the shadow of death on the way. You ever climbed a mountain and thought you got to the top, and when you got there, you realized, oh, this is just the summit of a foothill? And the real mountain was further back. I just couldn't see it from the valley. But I can't get from this summit to the higher summit. There's an intervening valley that I have to pass through al along the way. That's the stages of faith. That's growing up in God. And as we discuss the fall today, I hope you see some personal relevance. Because for us, we're the only church that believes in a fortunate fall. And I hope we can apply that to people who are struggling in their faith, because I think we all know someone who is, and probably not just one someone. It's one of the defining signs of the times is to watch people struggle in this, and the information age slash misinformation age is definitely faci facilitating that. But I love sitting down with people that are wrestling with things and feeling like they're totally off the path and just saying, welcome to stage two. How's the fall working out for you? How are you liking life east of Eden? And they're like, what are you talking about? And I explain this creation fall atonement model, and they realize, wait, I'm still on the path? It sure doesn't feel like it. Well, Adam and Eve might have felt that way for a while, too. And yes, there's no going back, but there is going forward. See, the problem is often people in stage one and stage two can't stand each other because they're on opposite ends of an extreme. Instead of correcting, they tend to overcorrect when you get into stage two, and that leads to some bitterness towards those in stage one. And honestly, people in each group they do have a leg to stand on as far as a sense of superiority is concerned. You see, like Elder Whitney said, the fall has a twofold direction. Downward is the vertical dimension, but forward is the horizontal dimension. And so people in stage one tend to look down on people in stage two and say, where's your faith? But people in stage two tend to look back at people in stage one and say, where's your brain? You see, while one group is just wants to stay in Eden where things are safe and secure, others, no, I want to, I want to head move forward. Or whether they wanted to or not, they're there, east of Eden. And instead of the two of them fighting one another for their lack of faith or their lack of intelligence, no, can we just keep, both keep progressing and, and simultaneously head onward and upward? In fact, that phrase is how I end up almost every email, onward and upward. And to me, it's not just a sign-off, it's an invitation, a beckoning to wherever you happen to be on the journey, no matter how low in the fall stage you feel, onward and upward is up to Gethsemane and the atonement. It's the way you come home. And, and honestly, there is such hope in, in inviting people along that journey. We will see that today. In fact, if last week was creation and this week is fall, then the rest of this year, and every year beyond, the rest of Scripture is atonement. It's how do we navigate the rest of our journey. Remember last week we talked about the four, the four rivers that flow out of Eden, and the four different types of soil in the parable of the sower, and the four different groups in Lehi's dream. As you emerge from creation to fall, where will the rest of your journey take you? Because the goal is still the tree of life. It's just not going back to it in the Garden of Eden. It's going onward and upward towards it in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where the real tree of life will be found. And, and I think if we can help people take those steps and navigate forward, uh, they'll be in... 
I mean, again, the, the parable of the sower, how does it end? What's the fourth type of soil? Good ground that's growing what? A tree that brings forth fruit. In uh, Lehi's dream, what's the goal of the dream? It's the tree of life. Alma 32, you're planting seeds of faith and hoping to move forward along the pathway of faith. And where does chapter 32 end? With a tree of life. We're all trying to return to, return to God's presence. And in a way that is, that is coming home to Eden, but not going back to it. It's going forward, back into the presence of God. And so my prayer today as we study fall is that we can make sense of where we happen to be even in times where we feel that we've gone downward and we're outside of God's presence. That's not the end of our story. In some ways, it's now pointing us in higher directions yet to come. And, this, and that leads to the second issue. If I always bring up stages of faith with people that are struggling, I also tend to bring up proving contraries every chance that I can. And the beauty of combining those two models is that in reality, stage one and stage two are just contraries of each other. You are, you are holding to one side without the other in stage one. And instead of correcting, you overcorrected. And in stage two, you held to the opposite contrary at the expense of the first. One way you can know you've come to stage three atonement is when you can prove the contraries of the stages that precede it. Uh, often it's, it's a sense of justice in stage one. That's why little kids, whenever they're watching movies, they're always asking, who's the bad guy and who's the good guy? Because it is black and white straightforward. Whereas stage two is often the mercy side, but without any justice. And no wonder our teenagers and young adults are so caught up in this world of moral relativism where you do you and no judgment from me and you can do no wrong and it doesn't really matter. Well, they've just overcorrected from the first stage. And when they can combine justice and mercy uh, in harmony divine, as Eliza R. Snow said, when they can prove that contrary, well, welcome to stage three atonement where you're balancing justice and mercy, where you're balancing law and love and truth and tolerance and community and individuality and all of those kinds of things. We will see today as we study the fall, not just our, our progression through this of faith, but also we will say, see a new set of contraries. We've already discussed the contrary of the infinite and the intimate when we talked about God. We discussed the contrary of dust and divinity when we studied human nature. Today, we will talk about contraries of, of the two trees. The two main trees in the Garden of Eden. It's just a set of contraries to prove. Life uh, or love and knowledge, that's the contrary of the head and the heart. And if the head is what draws you to the tree of knowledge, and the heart is what draws you to the tree of life, well, how do we prove the two? Since God does want us to develop both body parts. That's his aim for revelation, after all. I will speak to the mind and the heart. I'm giving you both fruit, okay? The fruit of both trees. We will see the contrary of, well, last week we saw it in the contrary of work and rest. Uh, we saw it in the contraries of the, of the atmosphere and keeping some things in and some things out in the world, but not of the world. We will see it today in contraries of male and female. And especially the way males and females try to do the will of God. Because the first and second great commandments, those, that's a set of contraries too. How do I love God with all my heart, my mind, and strength? That's what Adam was trying to do. And at the same time, love my neighbor as myself. That's what Eve was trying to do. Uh, you'll, you'll get that. To me, that's the cross. The vertical is loving God and the horizontal is loving neighbor. And we first set that vertical post in the ground to connect ourselves with heaven. First great commandment. But then we have something to put our horizontal cross beam on. Uh, that lifts our love of others higher than just ground level. It lifts that love heavenward. Uh, but we need both aspects. So again, there's so much we're, we're going to need to wrap our brains around today. We have Moses chapter 4 and 5, which is the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 3 and 4. Uh, chapter 3 of Genesis is the fall story, and then 4 is Cain and Abel. And we'll see both of those stories today in both Genesis and Moses. Now, the way it begins is fascinating because in the Genesis version, chapter two ended with the marriage of Adam and Eve as they both find themselves naked and not ashamed, totally exposed to the all-seeing eye of God and nothing to hide. 
I haven't done anything wrong, okay? Innocence, which defines stage one pretty well. But then Genesis 3 begins by introducing us to the serpent, this subtle serpent who slithers his way into the Garden of Eden. And subtle is the word that's used to describe him, more subtle than all the beasts of the field. Now, if we were reading this in the original Hebrew, we'd get a chuckle out of that, because when you go from the last verse of chapter 2, speaking of Adam and Eve being naked, to the first verse of chapter 3, speaking of the serpent being subtle, it's the same root word. So we're, we're getting a play on words here. And there's no chapter heading to break up the story. We go from naked man and woman to subtle serpent, and it just goes from, you just change the pronunciation of the word. You switch out a vowel, and that's it. Which suggests something here when we come to meet the serpent. I mean, subtlety is more of this cunning, this cleverness, this deception, which he's going to be an expert in. But couple that with nakedness of being exposed to the eye of God. Oh, you might be subtle enough to trick Adam and Eve, but you're not going to trick or deceive God. You might, Adam and Eve might be exposed to the view of God, but no one is more exposed to the demands of justice than, than he who offended it from premortality on. So as we meet this subtle serpent, be aware of just how uncovered before God he is. We get to see his plan unfold. Now to do that, we actually have a greater benefit in the book of Moses than we do in Genesis. Because like I said, you start with the serpent in, in verse 1 and it goes straight into, uh, into him uh, trying to deceive Eve. Whereas in the Moses version, you get four beautiful verses before the serpent slithers in. And what you see here is, rather than serpent in the garden, you get to see the dragon in premortality. You get to see the fall of Lucifer in premortality that precipitates and kind of gives us a preview of everything he's going to try to accomplish in this life beyond. So look at Moses chapter 4, verse 1, 2, 3, 4. In some ways, if we were going to, I have sometimes taught the fall and said, can we just call it the jump instead? Because as we'll see today, it didn't seem like Adam and Eve just tripped up over something and just fell on their face. This was a conscious decision to move forward in faith. And that doesn't seem like a fall to me. That seems more like a jump. Now, they didn't know exactly what they were landing on or in. Uh, and so, yes, there's some, uh, a wake-up call there. But if I wanted to talk about Adam and Eve, I'd call it the jump. If I wanted to talk about Lucifer, now there's a fall for you. And then if you want to talk about Cain and Abel, which we'll end with today, now there's a fall when it comes to Cain as well. But let's look at this fall of Lucifer first. Moses chapter 4, verse 1, And I, the Lord God, spake unto Moses, saying, That Satan. Now, Satan is just a Hebrew word that means, it's a title, not a, not a name, and it means the adversary. So let's talk about what you're up against. Let's talk about your adversary. That Satan whom thou hast commanded in the name of mine only begotten. Remember when you cast him out back in chapter 1? He is the same which was from the beginning. And he came before me saying, Behold, here am I, send me. Now with that, we're back to the end of uh, Abraham chapter 3, which we studied two weeks ago. This grand council uh, in heaven, the noble and great ones there with Christ and the Father, and whom shall I send? Well, here am I, send me, versus here am I, send me, and I will choose the first. Now that's our shortest version of that. You want a fuller account, then add oh, Revelation 5 and Revelation 12 and the JST of Luke 3. And there's some beautiful places to study this from a bigger perspective. But this is one of them. Because more than just, here am I, send me, this isn't just Lucifer echoing Jehovah. Instead, rather than an echo, it's, it's an, an altercation. It's an opposition in all things. And everything that you see from Lucifer has a better equivalent from Christ, from Jehovah. So notice them one by one. After saying, here am I, send me, he says, I will be thy son. Now, that's ironic since he wanted to be the father, not the son. Uh, Isaiah 14 helps us with that, that he wanted to usurp the throne of God. So I will be thy son when I really want to be the father. Now compare that to Jehovah's perspective. And for Jehovah, he could say, well, I don't have to claim to be thy son. I know I already am. He was the firstborn of God in the spirit. He was the one closest to God. He was a kolob equals Christ, right? Uh, and so there's no question mark on his part. And there's no desire for usurpation of the father's throne either. 
I, I'm content to be the son of God and to keep it at that. Well, go on in verse 1. I will be thy son, and I will redeem all mankind, that not one soul shall be lost. Now, Jehovah couldn't make the same boast. He couldn't say that no soul shall be lost, because he was there to honor agency. In fact, more than honor it, he was there to mitigate its misuse. I will make it possible for people to have agency and be able to compensate for their misuse of it that I will help them learn from their mistakes instead of being condemned by them. But those who choose not to repent, I cannot force them into heaven. Now, the irony here is when Lucifer is saying, I'll redeem all mankind. Well, none will be lost, I guess, but really none will be gained either. You're having them, I mean, what's the point of the trip if they don't learn anything along the way? Yes, they'll come back to be with God, but they'll never be able to grow up and become like God. Back to God's work and glory being twofold, immortality and eternal life. Lucifer could only guarantee immortality, but at a guaranteed loss of eternal life. Christ, on the other hand, could guarantee immortality through his resurrection and make a promise of eternal life for any who would repent of their sins which he also was making possible, at incredible personal cost, I might add. So when Lucifer says, I will redeem all mankind, oh, truth in advertising, he would have said, and at no cost to me. Because if you think about a removal of agency, and remember here that removing agency is not just removing choice, it can also mean re re removing consequence of choice. See, too often I think we think of Satan's war against agency as he's going to force you to choose the right. Well, he doesn't do that to me very often. He'd rather have me choose the wrong. But what he typically does is try to get me to eliminate the consequence of my decision, or at least forget that it's going to come. You see, if Satan could say, well, we'll just say there's no law, and then there's no sin, and then there's no consequence, and nobody is, is rejected from heaven. And if he was being honest with himself, he would have said, and there's nothing for me to pay for in Gethsemane. With no agency and therefore no consequence. No account. See, here's another set of contraries, choice and consequence, or agency and accountability. We will see both of those take pride of place in the story of the fall today. But if Satan can divorce choice from consequence and trumpet choice at the expense of consequence, tell you you can do anything you want, and then uh, give you false uh, reassurances that you'll never have to pay the piper, then again, there's nothing for him to pay for. Gethsemane would be a literal walk in the garden for Lucifer. When for Christ in Gethsemane, it was the exact opposite. It was, no wonder he fell on his face. There was a fall in Gethsemane because there was a fall in Eden. And Jesus was willing to absorb all of the consequences of that fall, all of the sin and suffering and sorrow and death and disease and everything else that would result from Adam and Eve's choice, Jehovah was willing to say, here am I and I will accept all of that. Again, what you see in verse 1 are so many counterfeits from Lucifer of the higher and holier volunteer that Jesus was willing to become. One of the most obvious you see at the end of verse 1, when Lucifer says, And surely I will do it, wherefore give me thine honor. That's what he was after all along. What's in this for me? Whereas Jesus Christ was the exact opposite. Yes, he could promise, surely I will do it. But he wanted no glory for himself. You see that more clearly in verse 2. But behold, my beloved son, which was my beloved and chosen from the beginning, See, he didn't have to run around like Lucifer did, saying, I am a son of God, like he did to Moses, like he's doing here. No, Jesus was the beloved and chosen from the very beginning. When the Father asked, whom shall I send? We all knew the right answer. He was just honoring our agency and honoring his beloved sons. You've been prepared for this. You've been chosen from the, for this from the beginning. But will you accept it yourself? Now's the chance to truly volunteer. We'll see the same thing today with Adam and Eve. You accepted the plan. You fought for it in pre-mortality. But now that you're there on earth, will you choose to move the plan forward? 
Again, another one of those here am I, send me kind of experiences. But back to Jehovah. He said unto me, Father, thy will be done, and the glory be thine forever. To juxtapose verse 1's description of Lucifer with verse 2's description of Jehovah, oh, no wonder we chose and fought for the right to follow Jesus. Now verse 3, wherefore, because that Satan rebelled against me, compare that to a Christ submitting always to the will of the Father, and sought to destroy the agency of man, compare that to Christ who again mitigated its misuse, who preserved and protected that agency. And then notice this phrase, which I the Lord God had given him. Now that's ironic. Sometimes we assume that, oh yeah, Satan was fighting against agency and God was offering it to us and there we were deciding if we wanted to have it or not. No, in reality, it was whether or not we wanted to keep it because God had already, give, had already given us agency. Where there is existence, there is agency as far as intelligence is concerned. And so, which I, the Lord, had already given him? I mean, think about uh, Alma 13, think about Doctrine and Covenants 93, that we had the power to choose in premortality. Why else would God say, whom shall I send? How else would there be a war of words and tumult of opinions, right? This contest over ideologies. We're choosing. We were choosing all along. And God had already given that to us. And according to Alma 13, we were forgiven from our premortal poor decisions by a preparatory redemption through Christ. DNC 93 tells us that we when we were born in infancy, we were innocent again. We had it, we lost it, we regained it at birth. All of that was through Jesus Christ. And so Christ, in fact, let me, let me say this. When we talk about the stages of faith being creation, fall, atonement, that's chronology. Creation happened first, then the fall took place, and then thousands of years later, the atonement occurred in Gethsemane. Well, that's the chronology. But logically, guess what came first? Atonement. The atonement was what was fixed in place. My chosen, my beloved from the beginning. There will be an atonement made so that everyone can come back to be with and be like God. There's no way to do it without the atonement. Now, to point people toward the atonement, there must needs be a fall. That will, is what President Benson used to say, you don't, need, you don't know you need food until you feel hungry. You don't know you need the atonement until you realize you're fallen. And so what, we're, what the point of all of this is atonement. There must needs be a fall to point people in that divine direction. And then the other question is, well, where are we going to do it? Well, let's create an earth. Remember the Abraham 3 account. We'll, we'll take of these materials and create an earth whereupon these may dwell so that we can see if they will do all things whatsoever they are commanded. Now we know that they won't. That's human nature. That's fallen nature. So again, that will drive them back to the atonement. So chrono chronologically, creation, fall, atonement. But logically, atonement, fall, creation. And that atonement was in place, infinite and eternal, even in premortality, guarding us against the consequences of the agency we had already been given. It's amazing. Keep going in verse 3. And also that I might give unto him mine own power, that's what the devil was after, by the power of mine only begotten, I caused that he should be cast down. Now that should let us know why Lucifer has had it out for Jesus ever since. You're the one that kicked me out of premortality. It was by your power that I was cast down. I honestly think that sometimes we take too much credit for our victory in the war in heaven. That, yes, we fought and we overcame. Well, yeah, we did, but at the end of the day, who really overcame? Jesus did. Uh, we even do that sometimes when we think of millennium and think, well, why, how will Satan be bound that thousand years? Oh, well, the wicked will be gone, only the righteous will remain, and the righteous won't listen to him. So he is bound because we give him no power. Now, Nephi does hint at that at the end of First Nephi, but he also adds, the Holy One of Israel reigneth. Oh, yeah, that's not just an afterthought. <laughs> that's really how Satan is bound. Yes, our righteous use of agency, I guess, deserves oh, some token praise. But who really deserves the glory for all of this? The only begotten Son of God. And then, of course, even he would say, oh, no, no, I don't want the glory. Give it back to the Father. It was his plan from the beginning. That was true of premortality. That will be true of millennial reign. It's true of everything in between. Yes, 
flex your spiritual muscles and resist temptation. But as Moses learned, and as we learned two weeks ago, it's only by invoking the name and power of Jesus Christ that we're ever really going to accomplish anything. Uh, we're starting to see that. Then last verse, verse four, and he became Satan, the ultimate adversary of everything good that God is trying to accomplish. Yea, even the devil, the father of all lies, to deceive and to blind men and to lead them captive at his will, even as many as would not hearken unto my voice. Another great place to juxtapose light and darkness. Satan on one side, the adversary, and Christ on the other, the anointed. The devil versus the savior. The father of all lies versus the son of truth personified. To deceive as opposed to what Christ always does, to reveal truth, to blind men. No wonder he's called the prince of darkness, as opposed to Christ who is the light of the world, to lead them captive at his will, as opposed to Christ who is there to free us from the consequences of sin. Even those addictive ones that trap people. It's a great description of what the adversary is after. And he'll do it to as many as will not hearken to God's voice. Is the answer as simple as that? Just hearken? It was in Lehi's dream. According to Nephi, that's what dad said. All it takes is don't give heed to the adversary's voice. Hearken to the voice of the father instead. And here now we are almost set up perfectly for Adam and Eve back in the garden being pulled in two different directions. Who will you listen to? Who will you hearken unto? Well, as now we transition into the serpent, more subtle, more naked, more exposed than anyone else. Well, notice what he's about to do. In verse 6, we see that Satan is going to use the serpent as his, his voice, so to speak. And perhaps this is just one big symbol of how the adversary is trying to uh, insinuate himself into the, into the desires of, of mortal men and women. But it says that he knew not the mind of God, wherefore he sought to destroy the world. Now, important detail. He didn't know what God was planning here. And so I imagine in some ways that his desire to beguile Eve to lead to the fall of Adam and Eve was, oh, this is going to destroy everything. It's going to destroy the world. It will mess up God's plan without realizing, oh, wait a minute, this actually helps move God's plan forward. I am providing some of that necessary opposition in all things. We'll see it later in this, in this chapter when the crucifixion is foreshadowed. And again, Lucifer probably thinks he's beating God because he's having his only begotten son crucified. Well, again, sorry to break it to you, Lucifer. That actually helps move the plan forward, too. Oh, if you hadn't helped, I'm sure we would have come up with a different way to do it. But God can take even your rebellion and turn it into steps in the right direction for the rest of humanity. It's exactly what he does here. Now, we could keep reading right here in Moses chapter 4. But I actually want to take you back to Genesis chapter 3 and use the Genesis account as our home base. Yes, we'll be taking frequent field trips back to Moses, but in order to do our best at, at building on common beliefs with our Jewish and Christian, Christian neighbors, uh, I think it's helpful to see just how much truth is right here on the page in Genesis, and then where can, can restored scripture add to the conversation. So, Genesis chapter three, verse one, here's the serpent, more subtle than anyone else. And notice how he begins. It says, and he said unto the woman, now, even before we finish the verse, I'm, I wanted to, I'm wondering, where's Adam in all of this? Now, we can get some additional insight from the endowment, but even just sticking with that, he says to the woman, so Adam doesn't seem to be anywhere present. That should tell us something first and foremost about the adversary's attacks. He tends to approach us when we are alone. He did the same thing with Joseph and Potiphar's wife. He waited for a time when there was no one else. It's interesting that often being surrounded by other people keeps us on better behavior. So no wonder he attacks when, when they are alone. We'll come back to that thought later. And then he says this, Yea, hath God said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now that's another great insight into the strategies of Satan. What's he doing here? He's trying to get Eve to question the commandments of God. Did he really say that? It's interesting how often that's our first step in the wrong direction is we start to second guess divine direction. We start to wonder, does that, does that commandment really come from God? Or does, does that really matter? 
Does it really matter what happens between two consenting adults? Who cares? It's not my issue. Does God really care what I put into my body or on my body or do with my body? It's mine after all. Uh, does, does, the, does it really, why would the prophet waste time telling us about these minor things uh, when aren't there bigger, more important things to worry about than my personal behavior? It's just interesting how he gets us to question commandments first. And notice also the adversary is focused on the, the perceived negative ones, the restrictive ones. Let's focus on that. Well, Eve flips it and she focuses on the more positive not on the restrictions of God, but rather on the permissions of God. And that's a good thing for us to do too, especially on the Sabbath, for example. Uh, we tend to turn it into a day of don'ts and focus on the restrictions when as far as God was concerned, oh no, the, the Sabbath was made for man to give you a chance to rest and grow up in God and step into a fullness of my glory. It's a day of do's. And that's how Eve sees, uh, sees these commandments. Verse two, the woman said unto, unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. So God has given us that, that our agency wide open. Now he, she does realize an exception to that. Verse 3, But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now interesting what she adds there at the end. Not just don't eat it, but don't touch it. Now would touching the fruit really have led to the fall of Adam and Eve? Uh, I, I doubt it. I mean, in some ways, she probably could have oh, touched it and, and squeezed it and, and thumped it and smelled it and done all the other weird things that we do in the produce section of the supermarket to try to guess what the best fruit would be. Yeah, you can do whatever you want with it. Just don't eat the thing. Well, I love the fact that God gives them a preliminary commandment. That this one came in pairs and there was an ultimate line not to cross. And then a preliminary line that would keep them from even getting close to the second one. That sounds like wise parenting to me. Uh, if, if there's a lookout over the Grand Canyon, for example, uh, or at the edge of, edge of a cliff, a parent's not going to say, oh, hey, kids, you can play along the edge as much as you want. Just make sure you don't fall over. No, there's going to be some literal or metaphorical line in the sand further back from the edge and saying, do not cross line number one because then you'll never have a chance to cross line number two. I think there's mercy in, and wisdom in God's preliminary commandments. He's keeping us away from the edge. I had a, a student years ago that said, you know, I always thought the church was so restrictive until I realized that when I go to the zoo, I'm grateful for the bars. I just laughed. I said, that's genius. He finally realized that the bars weren't keeping me out of the cage. They were keeping the adversaries in it. And to see God's commandments as protection instead of restriction is important. I actually used to do that test in seminary when I taught this lesson. I'd put a piece of candy on a student's desk and say, you can eat it, just don't touch it. And they're like, what? And there they are salivating as I'm tempting them. And they're like, oh, I can do that. And they usually would like roll out down their sleeves and then pick up the wrap wrapper in their, with their shirt. So they're not actually touching it with their skin. And they start to unwrap it and move it up to their mouth. And I say, oh, whoa, 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 don't touch it. And I said, I'm not. And I said, oh, with your mouth? You're about to. And they're like, seriously? I said, yeah, you can eat it. You just can't touch it with anything. And then they roll their eyes and say, I can't eat it if I can't touch it. Ah. Uh, I get it now. God is trying to keep me, hold me back from that. Here we need to add one thing that we only find in the book of Moses. And we read it last week, actually, but I've saved it for this week because it's, it has more to do with fall than it does with creation. And it's the recognition of agency, even there. You see, if we go back to the story in Moses, this time we have to go back to Moses chapter 3, but when God is presenting the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve, bringing them in, he says to them in verse 16, I, the Lord God, commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. So again, God leads out with permission, the do's, before there's any don'ts. Then 17, here's the one don't. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. That's in Genesis also. But then here's the phrase that's only in Moses, in the Joseph Smith translation of the Genesis account. Right on the heels of saying, don't eat of it, he then adds, nevertheless, so here's an exception to this rule, thou mayest choose for thyself, for it is given unto thee. 
Then he gets back to Genesis. But remember that I forbid it, for in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now you see what God is doing there? He's honoring agency, but also emphasizing accountability. And that's the contrary that God always tries to prove. Satan wants to eliminate either one. He either wants to say there's no agency, you have no choice in the matter, or he wants to overemphasize agency and minimize the possibility of consequence. No accountability. God is honoring both. I will let you choose for yourself. It's given unto thee. This tree is right here in the midst of the Garden of Eden for a reason. And the choice is yours. Just understand that the consequence is yours too. And if you want to stay here eternally, or as long as you want, in the Garden of Eden, then I have to forbid you from partaking of that fruit. Because the consequence will be an expulsion. You can't stay in the garden once you've, once you've outgrown it intellectually. When you've left stage one, there's no going back to it. And, and it's knowledge that typically leads people out. So I'm warning you about that consequence. Now, we don't all understand all the reasons why it had to be a transgression that would lead them to leave the garden. Why it had to be a breaking of some kind of law to precipitate that. But what's interesting about this whole account is that it forces the decision back on Adam and Eve. Now, as I hinted at earlier, they'd already made the decision, the decision in pre-mortality. We all had. At least the two-thirds of the host of heaven that sided with the Father and the Son at the expense of the adversary. But now they have to decide all over again. And this time it's harder. You see, people always complain that God had set Adam and Eve up with these contradictory commands. Commandment one was multiply and replenish the earth. But commandment two was don't eat the fruit. And I can't do number one unless I break number two. So what am I supposed to do here? But again, you see what the inspired version changes. It corrects. It clarifies. You can choose either way. Agency is eternal. You had it before. It was protected and preserved by Christ. It, the same is happening here. Do you want to stay in Eden? Or do you want to move forward along progression's highway? It is forward. That's the good news. But it's downward. That's the bad news. Choice is totally yours. Now, you chose before but I really want to honor your agency, not by giving contradictory commands, but by giving you a second choice or a second chance, I should say, to decide. You see, it's one thing to decide when it's all in theory. It's another thing to decide when it's in actual fact. Uh, in the book of Job, when it describes the, the council in heaven, it says that the sons of God shouted for joy. But then Elder Maxwell used to joke that said, yeah, but then we came to earth and sometimes wondered what all the shouting was about. It's like, really? I signed up for this? My life is way harder than I thought. Again, it's one thing when you think it's, oh yeah, it's just this trip down to earth. You know, my turn on earth is going to be wonderful. I get a physical body, whatever that is. Uh, and it's like, careful, you're going to feel pain, physical pain in that physical body. Oh, okay. Hey, anybody know what that pain thing is he keeps talking about? I don't know. I've never felt any. Well, whatever. It can't be as bad as, as what, they, what they say. Okay, sure enough. And yeah, death isn't in our vocabulary. We don't understand really any of those things, but we agreed because we knew it was the best way to come back to be with and like God. But now Adam and Eve have bodies. Yes, they're immortal, but boy, we're just a, a bite of fruit away from mortality. And when you're staring down the barrel of those kinds of consequences, boy, does that, do the consequences of the decision loom larger than before. This is not theoretical anymore. This is real. Uh, it's one thing to say, I hope they call me on a mission when I have grown a foot or two. It's another thing to have grown that foot or two. And you've got the paperwork in front of you or an appointment with the bishop. And am I really going to do this? I don't know. It was so much easier to make the choice when it was just something in some imaginary future. Am I going forward and going through with it? I love that God has enough faith and trust in Adam and Eve to let them choose a second time when it meant a lot more. See, this is how Lehi explains it in 2 Nephi 2, which is such a great chapter to, make, to give additional insight into the fall. He says, And to bring about his eternal purposes in the end of man, after he had created our first parents, and the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the air, and in fine all things which are created, 
it must needs be that there was an opposition. Even the forbidden fruit in opposition to the tree of life, the one being sweet and the other bitter. There's our contraries to prove. Wherefore the Lord God gave unto man that he should act for himself. Here's your agency. Nevertheless, it is given unto thee. Thou mayest choose for thyself. Wherefore, man could not act for himself, save it should be that he was enticed by the one or the other. And boy, would there be enticements on both sides. Because both life and love and knowledge, oh, they're, so, they're both so important. Both the head and the heart are pulling them, but they're being pulled in opposite directions. A life of ease with, with God in Eden, or a life of toil and suffering and sorrow, but also one of progress and growth, and an ability to multiply and replenish the earth, which is what God not just commanded us, but blessed us to be able to do. Remember, we saw that last time, a blessing, not just a command. Oh, they're, they're between a rock and a hard place. Not contradictory commandments, but mutually exclusive choices. And which will accomplish the greater good? I need you, Adam and Eve, to make that decision. Now, Satan doesn't know the mind of God. He doesn't understand that it's a win-win. It's a he wants to turn it into a lose-lose. And so he begins to question the command, like I said before. Notice what he does next. In verse 4, the serpent said unto the woman, Ah, oh, ye shall not surely die. Now that's a falsehood. That's a lie. But then verse 5, he does say the truth, tell the truth here. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now if we couple the lie in 4 with the truth in 5, what do we have? We have a half-truth. And boy, is Satan good at using those. If he can smuggle in a falsehood under the guise of something true, and if we swallow the whole thing without being discerning, then he can get us to fall. But in this case, again, notice what he does. There's a positive and a negative side of these consequences. But what he does in four is deny the negative. Oh, you're not going to die. And then overemphasize the positive. Oh, you'll be like God. You'll know good and evil. This is the best thing that could ever happen to you. Isn't that true to form? Doesn't he still do that? Doesn't, when we have a, play, a choice before us that's going to have some positive and negative results, if Satan wants us to make the wrong decision, typically what does what he do? Overemphasize the positives and underemphasize the negatives. It's actually interesting here, by the way, when he says it in verse 5, oh, God knows that, you're, that you'll become like him. You, you sense a subtle insinuation there, a little accusation like, oh, and of course God's going to tell you don't eat the fruit because he doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to know like he knows. Believe me, he does not want you to become like him. Now, the irony of that is the whole plan is trying to help us become like him. There's just a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And Satan had the wrong way. But what was Satan after? I wanted to be like God. I wanted to be the Father. I wanted to usurp the throne. And God said no to me. See, he doesn't want you to become like him. No, Lucifer, you just have to do it in the right way. Remember the oath and covenant of the priesthood? What's the final blessing? And all that the Father hath shall be given unto thee. He wants to give us all things. It just has to become in a way that we can... Something has to broaden our shoulders so that we can bear up under that weight of glory. Satan's plan would never work. It was a logical impossibility. But here he's accusing God of selfishness, when really it was selfishness himself that was making the accusation. Well, once 4 and 5 are behind them, then notice what happens in verse 6. Because verse 6 is where the fall actually takes place. And if you take verb by verb by verb, you can watch this descent downward into the fall. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, well, that's just the first step. She just, she started looking at it. She saw it and she began to see it in a certain way. She, she thought of some redeeming feature. Oh, it can't be all bad. It, it must at least be good for food. I mean, she's looking at the, 
the nutrition facts on the side of the box. And yeah, let's not talk about fat content and sugar content. There's a lot of fiber and that's good for you. I mean, we need roughage, right? So she sees it. Now she's looking at it long enough. She starts to rationalize that there might, there's probably some, some positive that would come as a result. And then what happens? That it was pleasant to the eyes. Now, I like the verb in the book of Moses even better. Genesis said it was pleasant. In Moses, it says it became pleasant to the eye. And that seems to be truer to, to the way things actually work. The longer you look at something and the more that you rationalize some, something good that would come from, from oh, hedging our bets on this one or lowering our standards on this one, then no wonder that object that at first was so repellent starts to become pleasant to our eye. In the 1700s, Alexander Pope, the great English poet, wrote a, 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 this epic poem called An Essay on Man. And one of the more famous phrases in it describes this process perfectly. He said, vice is a monster of so frightful mien as to be hated needs but to be seen. Yet, seen too oft, familiar with her face, we first endure, then pity, then embrace. And that's what Satan is banking on. Keep looking at that, Eve. Keep rationalizing. Keep justifying. Keep focusing on the positive. Minimize the negative. And pretty soon, it will become pleasant to the eye. What's the next phrase then? It was a tree to be desired to make one wise. Oh, now she's desiring it. That's where wisdom will come from. Next step, she took of the fruit thereof. Ooh, so she just crossed the preliminary precaution. She stepped past the first line. She hasn't fallen yet, but she's only a bite away. And now she's actually holding the fruit. What happens then next? Well, you can guess. After taking of the fruit thereof, she did eat. Now she's fallen. But the irony of Satan wanting to tempt you when you're in isolation he then wants to push you back into community in hopes that you'll be contagious. Oh, I, if I can lead them away on their own and then re-inject them into society to bring the other people down with them, then all the better. And that's exactly what happens. So she touches and then eats and then gives and her husband eats too. Now we're going to talk all about the consequences in just a moment. But before we do, I want to emphasize Adam's act right alongside Eve's act. Because as we wrestle with the fall and we'll see that it was a, an act of faith and courage and obedience to a higher law, accepting the consequences of their transgression. Like I said before, it makes Eve's act in Eden so much more meaningful than her choice in premortality. You see, in premortality, of course I accept the plan. But now coming down and staring mortality in the face, looking just outside the borders of Eden, going, yikes, that looks like central Nevada. No offense to you Nevadans. Uh, but that's not exactly the Garden of Eden. Yikes. Um, fallen life. Do we really want this? And she, she chooses. She accepts the consequences of a difficult choice. Now, if that showed her faith, what I love at the end of verse 6 from Adam's perspective is his willingness to follow her example, knowing what it would cost him. He could have stayed in the garden. Oh, you did it. You have to be expelled, but I'm still good. Instead, it was a matter of, no, if you're going, then I'm going with you. If you are ready to live a higher law, then I'm ready to live that as well. You see, part of the challenge here, uh, part of the wrestle for both Adam and Eve is, is again wondering, which commandment will I, will I keep? Which one do I prioritize? I've often heard this, and yes, male and female differences, important contrary to proof, can be oversimplified or overgeneralized. I don't want to descend into stereotypes. But the fact stereotypes exist, usually they're there for a reason. There's some kernel of truth at the core. And the interesting thing about men is often they want to be right, whereas women often want to do right. 
Men want to prioritize the first great commandment. I want to be right with God. Whereas women often want to prioritize the second great commandment. I want to be right with, with fellow man and fellow woman. Uh, what will do the most good for the most people? That's a, a very feminine perspective. Whereas a masculine is, nope, right and wrong, cut and dried, and this is just how it's supposed to be. I'm thinking with my head, and God said, don't do it. And Eve, I'm thinking with my heart. And how will we have children without taking this step? Well, like I said, in Eve's case, her decision to partake of the fruit was echoing her decision in premortality. It just meant more now. And, Eve, and, and Adam's choice to follow Eve into a fallen world echoed the marriage that we saw at the end of chapter 2. It's just so much more romantic now. <laughs> I've sometimes joked with, with my institute students as they're talking about or thinking about marriage all the time that I don't know how romantic the proposal was in Genesis chapter 2. Can you picture Adam getting down on one knee and looking up at Eve and saying, Eve, oh, you're the only girl in the world for me. Literally. I got no choice in the matter. Believe me. I just named every animal and they all came in pairs, and I, except me, until you showed up. Uh, and none of them are helps meet for me except you. So will you marry me? Since I'm the only option, and you're my only option. It's like, it's the flip side of the, if you were the last person on earth. Well, this one, it's, if you were the first person on earth. Well, I guess I'd be stuck marrying you. There's nobody else to choose from. Again, not a lot of romance there, because there's not a lot of choice. But now, Adam does have a choice. It's not between what girl will I marry. It's what life will I lead. And will... Will my life entwine with, Eid, with Eve's? Or will I be a lone man? I, I know God said it's not good for me to be alone, but I assume it's not good to be fallen either. What do I do here? And I love that Adam saw the higher good. Forget about Adam on one knee saying, hey, you're the only girl in the world. Imagine Eve on one knee in chapter 3 proposing to Adam, not will, not will you marry me, but will you stay married to me? Despite my, despite my fall. You see, back to the stage model of faith, it's the fall where everything falls apart. When converts to the church have their, their Eden experience at conversion, but then run up against things that are hard, it's during the fall stage that they leave the church. When in a marriage, you started in honeymoon creation stage. It's when things get hard in the fall that divorce happens. It's in the fall stage that people commit suicide because they don't think there's any way forward and they know now there's no way back. And I cannot stay east of Eden. I just can't do this. We have to have faith to move forward beyond the fall. And again, what amazes me about Eve's proposal to Adam and the romance behind Adam's partaking of the fruit is it was a choice to stay married in the face of difficulty. It was the, cho the choice of descending hand in hand together. And to me, that speaks volumes of their love. I love what Mark Twain, and Twain had some hilarious thing to say about Adam and Eve. He wrote whole like pseudo diaries of each and, they, and he was ripping on the, the two and they just couldn't get along and all these things were hilarious. But when all was said and done, and this he's reflecting upon his own wife who had recently passed away, in the voice of Adam, Twain says, of Eve, wherever she was, there was Eden. And to see that in terms of our relationships, in terms of our endurance of the fall stage, wherever we go, I know I can find a better Eden ahead. If she's there, we'll make it an Eden. If God is with me, we can, make, we can make a heaven out of any hell. And they had the faith to move forward. There, there's something beautiful there. Now, all of that being said, we only know that because of our restoration scripture. That it was a choice. That there was wisdom and courage in moving forward. Otherwise, there is no fortunate fall. And Eve did a bad thing, as my son was taught in preschool. 
Well, we have more than that preschool understanding, and I am grateful for it. Because without it, we are left with the unfortunate fall. And we're left cursing Adam and Eve, especially Eve, because she's the one that started it. Years ago, there was a, uh, an article in the Washington Post about the fall, and it argued correctly that the story of Eve in the book of Genesis, so without the book of Moses' help, has had a more profoundly negative impact on women throughout history than any other. And that's tragic. That a story should, that should elevate women in our eyes because of the courage and faith of Mother Eve, instead has her come crashing down to earth to a point of laying the blame for all the world's woes at her feet. She does not deserve it. She deserves to be put on a pedestal, not, not thrown down into a pit because of the courage of her decision. Now, how do we make sense of that? Part of it is what we just studied in, in that honoring of agency uh, and that recognition of consequence that it is given unto thee, thou mayest choose for thyself. Part of it comes from, our, from help with the, the second article of faith, what we studied back in uh, last year, that he differentiates between us being punished for our own sins and not for Adam's or Eve's transgression. Now, we have to be careful about distinguishing sins and transgressions because often in Scripture they're used synonymously. But if you want to use technical definitions of each, then there is a differentiation between sin and transgression. Uh, Elder Oaks, uh, with his incisive legal mind, has clarified the difference, saying that sin is something that's inherently evil. It's wrong even if nobody says it's wrong. Whereas a transgression is some, simply wrong because somebody said you shouldn't do something. And there's a consequence attached. Uh, when we talked about the second article of faith, I used the example of, of red octagons on the side of the road. There's nothing inherently evil about driving past signs on the side of the road. But if it does happen to be red and eight-sided, huh, then that's a transgression of a law. Because there's a consequence that you want to avoid, namely accidents at intersections. So you need to stop. Now, if I'm rushing to the hospital, for example, and I make sure nobody's coming the other way, then it probably behooves me to transgress that law. Trans just means across, and gress means go, so you're just going across a line. Nothing inherently wrong here. I'm just taking a step forward, aware of the consequences that will follow. And that's what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. They transgressed a law. Now that begs the question, well, how much did they know? And again, if they've already been told to multiply and replenish the earth, if they've been blessed with that, but they know they cannot have children. Now, some have asked, people of other faiths, like, what do you mean? Why can't they have children? Their view of Eden was that's the way life was supposed to be. We were sent to earth and we were supposed to all enjoy this Edenic experience in mortality. But no, Adam and Eve had to screw the whole thing up. To which I say, Wait, really? Then if, if, the, if the fall was a mistake, then what was the atonement? Uh, a quick fix? It, it, what, an afterthought? No, remember, creation, fall, atonement logically is reversed with atonement, fall, creation. The atonement is the most important thing, and it's the fall that points us towards it. I mean, Paul even teaches that in the book of Romans. Thank heavens for the law, because the law introduces us to the fact that we are fallen. And that's what wakes us up to our recognition of our need for the atonement. So thank heavens for, for broken rules, because it, it introduces us to the Redeemer, who can change all of that. We'll see more of that in a, in a verse in just a moment. So they must have understood something. Uh, God is not up there uh, pacing heaven going, oh, I blew it. Why did I put the tree there? I thought at least Adam and Eve would make it, but no, first generation, they've already screwed it up. No, that is not God. He's not back to the drawing board wondering, what am I going to do now? He knew that it was all based on the atonement. So one can assume that Adam and Eve must have learned at least some things before this occurred, that there, there is going to be a way to move forward and it's going to involve partaking of this fruit. By the way, when people say, no, they could have had kids. I had one uh, non-member, I was on Splits with the Missionaries in Tennessee and this pastor was like, what do you mean that they couldn't have had children? Where does it say that? And I realized, oh, it only says that in 2 Nephi 2. 
that they couldn't have had children according to Lehi. And so I talked about, well, innocence, and would they have understood procreation if they were in a state of complete innocence? But I said to them, you know, admittedly, the, only, the, re, the real reason that I, that I know they couldn't have had children is because I believe that Lehi was a prophet of God. And Lehi says that they couldn't, and so I'm, I'm sticking with that. They would have had no children, he said. Wherefore, they would have remained in a state of innocence, having no joy, for they knew no misery, doing no good, for they knew no sin. And so then that more famous verse from Lehi, Adam fell that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. Elder Oaks, in fact, built on that and gave us this statement. It was Eve who first transgressed the limits of Eden in order to initiate the conditions of mortality. Her act, whatever its nature, so there he's allowing for a symbolic interpretation of partaking of the fruit, whatever that might mean. It was formally a transgression, but eternally a glorious necessity to open the doorway toward eternal life. Adam showed his wisdom by doing the same, and thus even Adam fell that men might be. Now, Elder Oaks goes on. Some Christians condemn Eve for her act, and they've been doing that ever since, blaming women for the woes of the world concluding that she and her daughters are somehow flawed by it, but not the Latter-day Saints. Informed by revelation, we celebrate Eve's act and honor her wisdom and courage in the great episode called the fall. Joseph Smith taught that it was not a sin because God had decreed it. Brigham Young declared we should never blame Mother Eve, not the least. Elder Joseph Fielding Smith said, I never speak of the part Eve took in this fall as a sin, nor do I accuse Adam of a sin. This was a transgression of the law, but not a sin, for it was something that Adam and Eve had to do. Most simple is the statement from President Nelson, who said, We and all mankind are forever blessed because of Eve's great courage and wisdom. By partaking of the fruit first, she did what needed to be done. Adam was wise enough to do likewise. <laughs> I love that. Eve showed courage. Adam showed wisdom by following Eve's example. This was a time where someone had to have the guts to live into the second great commandment. And then Adam finally realized, oh, I guess this, this is still honoring the first, but in a higher and holier way. I don't know if you've ever been caught between the first and the second great commandment. It's a tough one. It really is. And I'm not saying it always has to be one at the expense of the other, because only the Spirit's going to help you navigate that. I, my wife and I were in a situation like that where we were caught between doing something right and doing something good. And it had to do with family with different standards than we typically follow. And what we do or don't do on the Sabbath, but what, what would this mean for them versus what would it mean for us? And, and I just remember being frustrated and say, I hate when I can't be right and good at the same time. And in that instance, we chose to be good and felt that God was, was honoring our decision uh, in a tiny way. Maybe that was indicative of what Adam and Eve were going through as they wrestled with this choice and its consequences. Now, like I said, because of our doctrine of the fortunate fall, we believe in the courage and faith and righteousness of Adam and Eve in this, in this courageous decision. But it does beg the question, well, how come it keeps talking about beguiling then? There does seem to be some, in fact, Eve even admits it later on in the same chapter. Well, the serpent beguiled me. And beguiling is, he tricked me, he deceived me. And I fell for it. And that idea of being beguiled, Paul repeats it in his epistles. Uh, Abinadi repeats that phrase uh, to the priests of Noah. The book of Ether mentions it as well. It always talks about Eve being beguiled, deceived. So how do you balance the two? That this was a, a decision made with eyes open and a decision they were tricked into? Hmm. Well, in some ways, maybe it goes back to what we saw earlier, that Satan's half-truths include truth and error, that he maximizes positives and minimizes negatives. And maybe that was part of his deception of Eve. Maybe Eve went into this thinking, Oh, the consequences couldn't possibly be as bad as, as they say. And it is a step forward that we need to take. And so I'm going to do this. Maybe that's part of her being beguiled. There's another possibility. 
The simple fact that Satan convinced her to do this on her own, and then later she had to go to Adam and convince him to do likewise. Like I said earlier, Satan attacks you often when you're on your own, but that was especially beguiling here because Eve ended up making a unilateral decision, the consequences of which were anything but unilateral. You understand what I mean by that? She made a decision on her own that didn't affect only herself. They affected Adam. And so if, if you know this is the right thing to do, talk about it together. Decide together. See, too often in couples, they, they think they're compromising by taking turns not compromising. No, no, you got to pick last time, so I get to pick this time. Well, yeah, I guess I'm only mad half the time, but one of us is mad all the time, and that's a horrible way to, to have a relationship. No, decisions have to be made together. I talked about this last year in our lesson on section 107, that decisions have to be made in unanimity, just like the presiding quorums of the church, that, that, they're, that they are equal in authority, and so unanimity has to prevail. And how do you get to a unanimous decision? By walking the path of Christ-like attributes. That's how your decision gets its calling and election made sure. If this isn't ringing any bells, go back and rewatch the lesson on 107. I told that story of a, a friend of mine who was making a decision that would affect his whole family, but he was trying to make it unilaterally. Remember this story? He asked me for a blessing and the Lord had already told me before he asked me for it, he's going to ask you for a blessing and you're not allowed to give him one. And when I realized why he was asking it, then I understood why I wasn't to give it to him. And I said to him, you married your blessing. The two of you have to make your decision together because it affects the two of you. It's a family consequence. It needs to be a family choice in a family council. You married your blessing, Eve. Talk it over with him. Between the two of you, prove the contraries of male and female. Prove the contraries of vertical and horizontal and, and obeying God but honoring neighbor. And prove the contraries of agency and accountability and choice and consequence. You're going to have to come up with a balance here. And the fact that you made the right decision but perhaps made it in the wrong way well, there's some beguiling going on there, too. Now, there's one other thing to think about here, and it's one I often bring up to my students, when it's like, well, how much did Eve really know? She knew enough to make a courageous, wise decision, but lacked enough knowledge that there was some beguiling going on. Well, how's that possible? And I always say to them, well, anybody serve a mission? They're like, yeah. I said, well, did you know what you were getting yourself into? They're like, of course I did. Oh, no, I didn't. I mean, I, I knew enough about a mission that I knew it was the right thing to do, but man, when I got to the field, it was way harder than anybody told me about. Well, they actually probably told you. You just weren't paying attention to the hard part. And then I'll say, anybody married in here? Well, uh, yeah. Uh, did you know what you were getting yourself into? Well, yeah, we loved each other. With... Oh, no. And we knew it was the right thing to do, but we had no idea how hard marriage could be. Anybody here have kids? Did you know what you were getting yourself into? Well, of course we... No. And do you get it now? Adam and Eve, did you know what they were in for? Oh, of course. No. Uh, yes, it was a jump forward, but it was kind of a crash landing in terms of just how real the realities of the fall would be. Uh, it's no more theoretical. It's actual. And this is hard. Again, this balance of knowledge and ignorance. Well, wel welcome to human existence, my friends, and not just in the religious realm. We all take leaps of faith and don't totally know, though we know in part, what we're doing. In fact, that helps explain the trickiest passage in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. See, in that verse, it talks about how we overcame the adversary in the war in heaven. So we could couple that with what we studied at the beginning of, of Moses chapter 4. It says that, it, first of all, it calls Satan the accuser of our brethren. It's the only place in Scripture he's given that nickname. And it's interesting to think about what kind of accusations would he have leveled in the war in heaven. Well, first, you can, you can picture him accusing, the adver the, accusing Christ of an inability to save us. It's like, wait, 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 wait. See, he's trying to leverage risk 
for his own reward. Is he's the one that his platform is no one will be lost. And so, of course, he's going to leverage our fear of being one that slips through the cracks on the Father's plan. Because what does it require? It requires Christ to live a perfect life and to affect a perfect atonement. And then second, it requires us to follow his example, true discipleship. So can you picture the two parties and therefore the two accusations that must have come out of the accuser of our brethren? First, Jesus isn't going to be able to do it. He will not save you. He can't live a perfect life. And number two, even if he could, you're not going to live a perfect life. You're not going to be able to follow his example. Believe me, I've grown up with you in pre-mortality forever. You're going to blow it. Well, if those are the accusations, Revelation 12, 11 tells us how we overcame. Three statements. Number one, we overcame him by the word of our testimonies. Number two, we overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Now, those two would go together with those accusations. Jesus isn't going to be able to save you. How do we overcome that? The word of our testimony. I know he'll be able to save me. He's the chosen from the beginning, prepared from pre-mortality. And what about me? <laughs> I won't be able to follow him? Well, there you're actually probably right. I will screw up in life. Not as bad as you're screwing up right now, Lucifer. But yes, I will make mistakes. But that's where the blood of the Lamb comes in. That's where the atonement of Christ will, will bring forgiveness to me. So how did we overcome the accusations? through the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. But there's a third statement in that verse that's always confused me. It says, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Well, what does that mean? They loved not their lives unto the death? Oh, that, that explains how they were able to overcome their fear of risk. As Satan is leveraging that fear that some of you might not come home. It's like, well, yeah, but in your plan, we'll all come home, but for no purpose. We'll be no different than the day we left. The Father's plan, yes, has risk, but it's all mitigated by the atonement of Jesus Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. I love my life here in pre-mortality with my Father. But I don't love it so much that I'm not willing to risk it in the face of death itself with the promise of a greater life on the other side of it. So this goes back to creation, fall, atonement. I had something good. It was terrestrial, at least. And, but do I love it so much I'm not willing to descend into a telestial existence that eventually can culminate in a celestial existence? Or am I just going to hold on to what I've got? Do I love my life so much that I'm scared of losing it? That would have stopped us from following the Father's plan in pre-mortality. It would have stopped Adam and Eve from stepping forward into the unknown when it came to the fall. It would stop you from serving a mission or getting married or having children. Because life before a mission, I mean, you're finally emerging into your own and kind of doing your own thing and having some freedom. Man, you can love that life. Unfortunately, you can love it to the point you'll never let it die and you miss a mission. Some of you young adults that have never been married, and maybe you've been single long enough that yes, there's a loneliness there, but also there's an incredible independence and freedom there that I don't have to worry about anybody but me. Now, I'm not trying to minimize anyone's challenges if that's what you're going through. But for those that, I'll, I'll, I have met some that that verse pops into my head when I see their situation and think, ah, oh, you love your single life too much to risk it and step into the unknown of marriage. Or for some of you young couples that don't have children yet, for your own choice. I'm not talking about those who cannot yet have children uh, through, no, through no choice of their own. But there are some, and there's a part of me that looks back to my early marriage we wanted to have children immediately and they just wouldn't come. So surgeries later and miracles and we finally had children of our own. But I look back at that and sometimes my wife and I say, why didn't we go on dates every single night? We could have. Oh, we loved our life of, as just husband and wife, but we didn't love it so much that we postponed its death with the coming of children. I, again, I love that phrase from Revelation 12. They loved not their lives unto the death. And that describes Adam and Eve perfectly. 
like I said, that's what makes their choice so much more meaningful in Eden than in pre-mortality. It's what makes Eve's proposal so much more romantic than Adam's. We're choosing here. And those are the kinds of decisions that you and I are forced to make all the time. Last week when we were talking about creation, I mentioned a book by Beverly Campbell called Eve and the Choice Made in Eden. It's a masterpiece. Uh, beautiful research, so many quotes from other prophets and apostles, and Sister Campbell herself says some amazing things. Here's one example. Discernment, the ability to see beyond the literal to the divine essential, has ever been God's gift to women, since Eve was the one who saw it first. Since Eve, women have faced the challenge of ambiguous choices that carry with them holy, life-altering consequences. On the correct resolution of these ambiguities hangs the future of generations, the civilizing of society, the basic dignity of the human race, and more to life itself. Daily, women must make decisions based on things not seen or even known clearly. Often these decisions require great leaps of faith. Frequently, these decisions must be based on what serves the greater good for the greatest number. Often, such decisions require women to set aside their own well-being in favor of another's. The very process of bearing children illustrates this truth dramatically. It is a source of strength and comfort to many women to know that inherent in their divine nature is this innate ability to be in tune with God's purposes. Eve was indeed in tune with God's purposes. And Adam showed that he was in tune with them as well. Their eyes were open, at least to some degree, to those consequences. And with faith they moved forward. In fact, open eyes is what we see right on the heels of the fall. Back in Genesis 3, verse 7, as soon as they ate of the fruit, the eyes of them both were opened. And what's the first thing they see? And they knew that they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, the irony here is they've been naked all along. Now, back at the end of chapter 2, they were naked and not ashamed. So here, what's changed? Not their nakedness, just their lack of being ashamed by it. Like I said before, the beauty of the fall is it, it tells us how desperately we need the atonement. The beauty of the law is the fact that it, it holds a mirror up to our imperfections and shows us where we're falling short. It, it points out the fact we've always been naked. We've always been uncovered and never lived a perfect life. Their eyes are now open to that. But the irony here is they try to take changing that reality into their own hands. And so they make these makeshift aprons out of fig leaves and try to cover their nakedness. Now, to me, the irony of this is how pathetic fig leaf clothing would be, especially when compared with what ultimately covers their nakedness, which we'll see at the end of this chapter, is a coat of skins that the Lord provides for them. Now, I'm going to try to be sensitive the way I say this, but I want you to think about even when we are ultimately clothed by God and covered by His atoning grace, there is power in being reminded at our pathetic attempts at covering ourselves. We cannot cleanse ourselves from sin. It's beyond us. We cannot work out our own forgiveness, it comes as a gift of grace. And no matter how hard we try, no matter how many fig leaves we sow together, it will never be sufficient to purify our hearts or cleanse the blood from our garments. It takes a holier garment from God to do that. He has to provide for us the robes of His righteousness because compared to that, as Isaiah says, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. Or as Adam and Eve would say, they're nothing more than fig leaves. I am grateful that even when I am covered by Christ, I'm forced to remember my own individual attempts to clean myself up, to make myself presentable to God, because it's insufficient. And when I can see the two side by side, I realize that my hope is not in self. It's only in Savior. I can only come clean through Christ. They will come to know that. But in the meantime, 
Verse 8, they heard the voice of the Lord God. He's walking through the garden, and Adam and Eve hide themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now, ask Jonah about how successful we can be about, uh, when we try to hide from God. <laughs> okay, he can see all the way to Tarshish. Believe me, he can see through the trees. He planted the garden after all. There's even an irony there of you're hiding among the trees when in reality the trees are your ultimate hope and destination. The tree of life is the one thing that will save you. Can't you see that? Don't hide behind it. Come unto it. Hide from God? No, it's come unto Christ. Yes, he'll show you your nakedness, but then he'll provide the garment to cover your nakedness. You understand, the, the, again, the irony here? God is not the problem. God is the solution. So don't hide from God. Come to him. Don't hide your sins. Fully expose those sins to him. Confess of your sins. Let him see. He's aware of them. You see, when I was a little boy, every once in a while I would do something wrong. And my mom would warn me, just you wait till your father comes home. I don't know if that was her just not wanting to have to deal with it or just to her to, to, to prolong my penitence until at least dad got home. But those words struck fear into my soul. Now, my dad was not the violent type. I didn't fear self-destruction, but boy, did I fear his disappointment because he never seemed to do anything wrong. In fact, later when I was in high school, I was on a road trip with his dad, my grandpa, and I said, so what did dad do wrong when he was young? I was looking for some, some blackmail, right? At least some leverage if I, when dad knew that I'd done stupid things. Well, grandpa scratched his head and he said, you know, that's the weird thing about your dad. It never crossed his mind to do anything wrong. And I'm like, oh, I'm so dead because it does cross my mind. Uh, and if I've got nothing to work on, then, then I, I'm toast. Well, I felt like toast when I was a little kid. And when dad comes home, I, I believe me, I wasn't singing. I'm so glad when daddy comes home on those days. I was scared to death. Now, we had this end table next, in the living room next to the couch. It was pretty small. We would keep all of the old church magazines in there after we'd read them. But I, I knew pretty well around the time that daddy came home from work. And on those days where I was scared to death of punishment, I would take out all the church magazines from the end table, hide them underneath the couch, and then squeeze my little body into that tiny little claustrophobic end table. If I got my rear end in and then kind of scrunched my back and pulled my legs in after me, and then I could grab the screw that held the knob on and then close myself back into welcome oblivion. I just didn't want my dad to know where I was. I wanted to cease to exist, as Alma said. But you know what? I totally misjudged my father. Was there some disappointment? No, sure. But there was love, and there was forgiveness, and there was a desire to teach me how to do a better job of growing up. And, and yes, he knew that better from personal experience. I think when we hide from God instead of coming to him, it's because we don't know him. We misjudge him. We fear retribution when we should be asking for redemption because that's always what he's coming to offer us. The solution is right here. Tree of life, don't hide behind it. Learn to come partake of its fruit. Don't hide from God, come to God. It's sin you should have been scared of. Well, verse 9, God plays dumb, which is interesting. I think priesthood leaders sometimes do that. I know parents often do. To try, to try to give people a chance to confess instead of to extract a confession from them. So the Lord God calls to Adam and he says unto him, Where art thou? Now the Genesis version, it's where art thou. The Moses version, it's where goest thou. Now, I think both of those can be right. And I love both questions. As if he's saying, Adam, forget geographically. I know exactly what tree you're hiding behind in the garden. The fig leaves don't match the, the, the other shrubbery. But do you know where you are? And do you know where you're going? Do you have any idea the position you are placed in at the, at the edge of Eden 
the cusp of creation and ready to descend into the fall. You're about to move downward, but forward. I think if God could just reassure us, I know where you are. I know where you're going in positive ways. And beware, I know that you might be headed in negative ways. Do you know where you're headed as you're making these decisions? Well, verse 10, Adam responds, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. I hid myself. Remember Satan plays on fear all the time with Moses? That's what led Moses to see the bitterness of hell. Well, here it's what leads Adam and Eve to see, to the, see their own shame and to fear God instead of having faith in him. Verse 11, God says to Adam, who told thee that thou wast naked? In other words, whose judgment are you fearing here? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? So again, I'm playing dumb to give you the opportunity to confess, to speak up, to act instead of be acted upon. And so Adam does. Now these next few verses, unfortunately, a lot of people interpret as Adam passing the buck to Eve and then Eve passing the buck to the serpent. It's like, oh, it's not my fault, it's hers. Oh, it's not my fault, it's its. Well, that's one way to read it, but I read it instead not as a passing of the buck, but as a taking of accountability and explaining the situation. This is what the situation I was in. This is the decision I made. Here's some of the reasons I made it. In Adam's case, he says, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And in the Moses version, it adds, and commandest that she should remain with me. Now, do you see what he's acknowledging there? God, you gave me this help meet for me. And she is suitable. She's meet. She's equal. And she is a, an enabling power, enabling us both to move forward on this plan. You gave her to me. You commanded her to remain with me, which I assume also meant commanding me to remain with her. And so this higher law, I lived. And when she partook of the fruit and gave it to me, I made a choice to remain with her. Then it's Eve's turn as the Lord turns to her. What is this thou hast done? The woman responds, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Which isn't blaming the serpent as much as it is acknowledging I fell for some of his, his cunning ways. I should have thought more about both the negative and the positive consequences. I really should have waited to make the decision alongside my help meet as equal partners. Well, the Lord then go, it started with Adam, then to Eve, and then the serpent, and now God is going to go in reverse and pronounce a punishment upon, or I should say a consequence on the serpent, and then on Eve, and then on Adam. Now I hold back the word punishment, or even the word curse, although that word is used, because each of these punishments were blessings in disguise. Now, a curse maybe if you want to see it that way, but a curse that pointed to a greater blessing. You'll see what I mean. Verse 14, The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now, so far, that's all curse <laughs> no, and no blessing. But the, the punishment does fit the crime. Lucifer... You have tried to ascend above all, so instead you will have to descend below all. On your belly thou shalt go. You have, have wanted to live into the divinity side at the expense of the dust side. And so dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. Now the blessing comes in 15. I will put enmity, which is conflict or, or animosity, opposition, enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. Now this enmity between, this is not women being afraid of snakes. This is far more theological than that. This is an inborn animosity between women and evil. Now I'm not trying to hold women to a higher standard, nor am I trying to let men off easy, because well, you're just, you're not made in the same way. But there is something beautiful here about oh, the natural animosity that at their best, God's daughters feel towards anything that draws them away from their heavenly parents. I'm grateful for Eve's 
example in that. I'm grateful for my wife and my daughters and my mothers and my grandmothers, my sisters. It's the women I have seen in life do such a, a natural job of overcoming the natural man. It's an, it's an amazing thing. And then when he says, between thy seed and her seed, now the seed of the woman could just mean all of posterity. But there is one who is uniquely qualified for that title. The seed of the woman in the absence of man. And that's Jesus Christ. He is the seed of Mary mortally in the way that he is not the seed of any mortal man. So he is uniquely the seed of the woman. And you want to talk about enmity between Lucifer and Jehovah. Well, we saw that earlier. That goes back a long way. And, and how will that enmity be manifest? Satan, this serpent, will try to, to attack Jesus, will try to sink its fangs and poison him. But what's it going to amount to? A bruised heel that comes in the very act of the Savior crushing the head of the serpent. That's what I hinted at earlier about Satan not knowing the mind of God. And kicking Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden was actually kicking them forward. And, and pushing for the crucifixion of Christ. Oh yeah, you got him. You bruised his heel all right. And then he ascended up on high and took captivity captive and banished the death itself. Boy, did you get crushed, Lucifer. Now, again, moving the plan forward. Now that's the serpent's curse slash blessing pointing to the atonement of Jesus Christ. Then how about 16? Here's the woman's. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Now that word sorrow is a poor translation. Uh, the original Hebrew would be better translated as pain or suffering or labor. Or why do you think we call childbirth labor? Okay, toil, travail, all of that pain and suffering. So I will multiply that kind of pain and anguish in your conception. And then he adds, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. So the, the irony here is, yes, there's a curse, so to speak. But the curse will actually be a blessing because that pain will bind you to that infant like nothing else could. Even in our day when, when pain can be mitigated... By epidurals. My wife always joked that epidurals are the compensation for having to live in the last days. We have to deal with so many spiritual uh, trials that we can at least have some <laughs> an epidural when we give birth. Okay, and after I saw my, all my wife went through, even with an epidural, after our first birth, I told her, I said, "Honey, one of us is always going to get an epidural. If it's not you, then dibs for me. But one of us is going to do it." Uh, and those that have gone through it without epidural, my hats off to you. But either way, there is pain, there is labor, there is suffering, and yet there is such joy that comes as a result. Multiply and replenish? Oh yeah, what a blessing that is, even when there is pain attached. The verse then ends, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, if the Washington Post was right that the fall account has done more harm to women than anything else, well, that is exhibit A, because that verse has been used for centuries to justify misogyny and unrighteous dominion and, and everything else. You see, we're, men are supposed to rule over women. It says so in the Bible. And your desire is supposed to be to me. Well, there's a couple of ways this verse has been interpreted. It can, is it meant to be descriptive or prescriptive? In other words, is this describing in, in a negative light, worst case scenario, how things are going to end up being? Or is this prescribing in a more positive light the way things ought to be? Now let's grapple with both for a moment. On the descriptive side, it may be that he's simply saying, you know what, you're going to want, uh, your, your desires are going to be his direction, but his desires are going to be in yours, and both ways it's going to become kind of a domineering one against the domineering other. You see, even, there's even a new, a more modern translation of this that takes that approach and says, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. Talk about a lack of equal partnership. Talk about a lack of recognizing one another as helps meet for each other. This goes back to what we were talking about with DNC 107, that you're making unilateral decisions. You're taking turns 
not compromising. And that's your view of compromise. <laughs> that's not the way it works. Now, if that's the description of this is the way things are going to end up in worst case scenario if you two don't figure this out. There's your curse, Eve. Or on the other hand, is this the blessing, a prescriptive, this is how things need to be. There needs to be desire for one another. Instead of you wanting to just call the shots on your own, I need your desire to be to your husband and his desire to be toward you. That's what equal partners are for. That's what, that's what help meets are. And then what about that he shall rule over thee? Now, President Kimball said a better word would have been preside, to preside over you. See, even in the proclamation of the family, when it says that men are called to preside in the home, well, is that a ruling over? Well, it also says equal partners, so there's a set of contraries that needs to be proven. Yes, I guess somebody needs to make a final de decision. There is one steering wheel in the car, but the other person should have equal access to the, to the, to the map. And I, I said this last year in, the, in that same conversation about DNC 107. Imagine if one side had the steering wheel and the other side of the car had the brakes and the gas. Boy, you would have to come to a unanimous decision before you decided to move forward, or you wouldn't go anywhere. Well, I think there's truth to that. And again, DNC 107 balances the contraries of equal in authority and under the direction of, as it refers to the three presiding quorums of the church, First Presidency Quorum of the Twelve Quorums of the Seventy. Again, that's the lesson to go review that. And so in a couple, is there under the direction of? Well, seems like it. Is there equal in authority? There better be. What kind of an organizational model is that? Well, it's one that unanimity has to reign. And so this is not a presiding authority barking out orders and delegating to-do lists. It's a presiding authority coaxing out of every member of the council their piece of the revelatory puzzle that God has scattered among them all, okay? That's how decisions need to be made in the home and in the family. Elder L. Tom Perry said, the wife is not the vice president, okay? She's not second in command. It's equal partnership here. Which makes me wonder again about that phrase, and he shall rule over thee. Now, when I was in an undergrad in college, I was taking Old Testament and beginning Hebrew from uh, Dr. Donald Perry. Now, Don Perry is, he knows his stuff. He's, he was on the International Dead Sea Scrolls team. So yes, expert in Hebrew. Uh, at, at one point in class, he described a conversation he had recently had with a young apostle, or at least younger, his name is Russell M. Nelson. Now, if you know anything about President Nelson, he loves words, loves etymology. He's gifted at learning languages himself. But at one point, probably preparing a talk, he called Dr. Perry and said, can we talk about Genesis 3.16? And that phrase, rule over thee, is there anything the Hebrew would give us to help us understand that better? And Dr. Perry went back to the Hebrew and saw, yeah, okay, and he shall rule over thee. Yep, that is what it says. Ooh, but is that the only thing it could say? Hmm, because we've all, you see, what it consists of is a verb and a preposition and a pronoun. Rule over thee. Now, rule is mashal in Hebrew, and every time it's used in, in the Old Testament, it's describing a ruler uh, in terms of like a king over his kingdom or an, an emperor over his empire. And so what's the preposition that's always used? Over. Because kings rule over kingdoms. Emperors rule over empires. If you're going to use a preposition with rule, of course it's always going to be over, and so it always is. But... Is that the only way to translate that preposition? Actually, no. Hebrew prepositions can typically be translated in a lot of different things, depending on context. And again, this context would always assume over. Makes sense. But kind of like por and para in Spanish, or de in Spanish, it could be of, it could be from, it could be several different things. You just have to read it in context. Well, in this one, as he was telling us this story, by the way, our, our, as students, our minds were racing because we learned a bunch. We had already learned a bunch of the, pro, the, pro, the prepositions. And the one that we saw on the page was the letter bait, B, just B. And the B sound and then connect it to the, the, the pronoun would be over her or over thee, over them, over the kingdom, whatever. 
But when I looked at ba and realized, wait a minute, like our first week of Hebrew, when we learned the prepositions, the most common translation of ba as a preposition is not over, it's with. And boy, did that open our eyes. And that's one of the things that Brother Perry shared with President Nelson. Now, that's not to say that it has to be that. Over, rule over her is a correct translation. And I know of other Latter-day Saint Hebrew scholars that would push back and go, no, we, it still needs to be over because every other instance is. But again, part of the challenge is this could be a unique situation because it's not talking about a king over his subjects or an emperor over his empire. And not just good or bad grammar, it's better theology to make it with. Because if you think about it, what's the only place, where's the only place that a man will rule over anything? The highest degree of the celestial kingdom. And what's the only way to get there? Is to have a companion to rule with. Our only access to the highest degree of the celestial kingdom, where there is some sense of rulership with inter eternal increase and eternal progression, it requires the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. It requires and help meet for thee. And so take it however you'd like in Genesis 3.16. And be strict in your translation of the Hebrew and fine. Just make sure that you're ruling over in righteousness, in gentleness and meekness and love unfeigned. But with the possibility, the intriguing possibility of a ruling with, since this is no king or emperor, this is husband and wife, meant to be equal partners in the family of God. It's amazing. Not quite the curse we sometimes think it. We'll talk about a blessing. And then same with Adam. His curse slash blessing in 17 is beautiful as well. To Adam, God says, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Here's the result, the consequence. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Now notice he didn't say, Adam, you are cursed. He said the ground is cursed, but the ground is cursed for thy sake. Mm, that sounds like a blessing in disguise. And what is that blessing? It's the fact that you're going to have to work, and work will be a blessing for you. When he says in sorrow you'll eat of the ground all the days of your life, that's the same word that Eve was given. Not just sorrow, but rather suffering, rather toil and pain and labor work like we saw in in the creation in, in the in the seventh day that rest is a spiritual necessity even if it's not a biological one since gods don't get tired well in this case work is a spiritual reality even when it's not an economic reality even if you don't have to work to pay the bills because you have enough already you need to work to feed the soul. And that's exactly what Adam is being blessed to do. See, in some ways, there's a beautiful parallel between Adam and Eve here. Eve, you are going to suffer to bring life out of the womb, just like Adam is going to suffer to bring life out of the ground. You're both, you're both going to grow and progress and bring life forth in your own way. And in both instances, it will be a blessing to you. He then says interesting phrases in 18 and 19. Thorns also and thistles shalt it bring forth to thee. Thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. Dust thou art, unto dust thou shalt return. And there's the end of Adam's curse slash blessing. Now, I was thinking about this because there's so much symbolism here that all seems to point forward to Christ that the, the enmity between the seed of the woman and the serpent and the bruised head and the, and the, or the crushed head and the bruised heel, that's all pointing to the Savior. To think of a mother in labor and anguish, Isaiah uses that imagery to speak of the love of God. There's so many things pointing forward to Jesus. And I wondered about that with Adam's, the, the language of, that was given to Adam as well. And then it hit me once. Thorns and thistles and sweat and bread can those, be, those, can those elements be symbolic of greater glories yet ahead? And then it hit me. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, By their fruits you shall know them. And then he says this, Because will men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? 
That's a rhetorical question. The answer is, of course not. If, you, if you've got a thorn, a grape's never going to come of that. If you have a thistle, it's never going to grow a fig tree. And yet, symbolically they do, through Jesus Christ. If you think about the crown of thorns being rewoven into a crown of glory, and the blood of Christ providing the symbolism of that sacramental wine, oh, the atonement of Christ does bring grapes out of thorns. And what about figs, figs from thistles? In the New Testament, the fig tree is used as a symbol for the second coming, when Christ will make every wrong thing right again. Oh, so even out of thistles, Christ, through his atoning grace, can bring forth figs, and all will be well. By the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread. What's Luke say about the atonement of Christ? That, God, that Christ sweat great drops of blood? In order to give us what? The bread of life? To eat my body and drink my blood and never hunger nor thirst again. There's that great line in the Christmas carol, Joy to the World, where we sing, He'll come and make the blessings flow far as the curse was found. Oh, these curses to serpent and Eve and Adam. Christ will come to make the blessings flow far as that curse was found. The Lord will bring beauty from ashes. And the fall, when pursued correctly, will always culminate in the atonement. Beautiful promises here. Well, verse 20 then, Adam calls his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. That seems almost out of place after all of these slams, right? These, these curses. Oh, no, they get it. They see the blessing side. And right then, this also seems out of place in terms of, is this a little late? Haven't we been calling her Eve all along? No, this is where we first learned her name. Remember earlier, Adam just said, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Now, last week when we discussed that verse, we realized that he's not exercising dominion over her by defining her the way he defined the animals. Remember when we name something, we define it, we, we exercise some dominion over it. I get to call you what you are. But in the case of woman, he's simply, she's the same as me. So I'm Ish and she's Isha. It's man, woman, it's the same term. I'm recognizing that. But now it takes it up another notch. Now I'm recognizing really who she is in terms of identity and divine purpose. This is Eve. This is Chava which in Hebrew is Eve, and also it's life, it's lives. She is the mother of all living. And don't forget the fact she still hasn't had any kids. Sherry Dew pointed this out, and what a blessing that it came from her, since she's still waiting for that blessing herself. When will I have children of my own? I don't know. But in the meantime, I know I'm a mother, because I'm a daughter of God. And even before she gave birth, Eve is recognized for not just what she was meant to do, but rather who she was intended to be. Motherhood is a matter of identity far more than activity. It's far more a matter of nurturing than just giving birth. In fact, it's so interesting that we call it mothering. Oh, she's mothering a child. Sadly, what do we say about dads? When we say, oh, he's, fathered, he's fathering a child, that's confined or reduced down to the sexual act itself and alone. That's tragic. I'm offended by that, honestly. What does it mean to father a child? Oh, it means to, to engage in the act of procreation and to help a woman conceive. Yeah, you're done. You're done fathering. That's not what we say to mother. To mother a child is to give birth? No. We say to mother a child is to nurture them, to raise them. Well, that should be the equivalent of fathering too. I'm still fathering my children. I'm still trying to raise them. And I'm, I'll never graduate from that responsibility because it's more than responsibility, it's identity. That's beautifully clarified there in verse 20. She is the mother of all living. By the way, Joseph Smith once taught that when, when God breathed the breath of life into Adam, 
He did the same with Eve, but the word ruach, which means breath or spirit, should have been translated not breath of life, but rather lives. That for her, as opposed to Adam, oh, I am a multitude, you could say. Then, verse 21, we see the Lord making coats of skins and clothing Adam and Eve. And like we said earlier, what a, what a difference, what a glorious difference than those fig leaf aprons that they had tried to fashion for themselves. No, let, let me give you something far better. Coats of skins. Let me clothe you with them. Or another word that could be used, let me cover you with them. When we talk about robes of righteousness, when we talk about clothing covering someone's nakedness, it's important to realize that in Hebrew, the word to cover, which is kafar, is the word that's always used for atonement, a covering of our sins. Yom Kippur is the day of atonement. Yom means day. Kippur means, it comes from kafar. It's the same root. It's the day of covering, the day of atonement. The covering of the Ark of the Covenant is called the throne of atonement because that lid covers the covenant within. Anytime in the Old Testament, when you see something covering something else, look out for atonement symbolism. It will probably be waiting in the wings. And that's true of this one particularly. I will give you something to cover your nakedness. And what will it be? You can pull some fig leaves off and the tree will just grow more leaves to replace them. But to take a coat of skins, this is not the serpent skin. He's not shedding skin and going on living. For an animal to give you skin to use, it will cost the animal its life. This is a sacrifice. And so for the Lamb of God to make clothing to cover the sins of each of us would require an act of sacrifice. In Christ's case of self-sacrifice. Beautiful imagery there. Well, verse 22, the Lord then says, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. Now, he didn't say that jealously. He didn't say it angrily. He didn't say it bitterly. Son and daughter, you're growing up in me. You're taking steps forward. Now, I want to make sure they remain steps forward, and therefore they can never be steps back. I have to move you out of Eden and then block the way of of an unauthorized return. The only way to come back is to come full circle. It's up and over and beyond, onward and upward to atonement. And so what does he do at the end of 22? Lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. And we would add, in their sins. Since they haven't had time to repent or to change or to learn from them. Then what will we do? Well, let's give them that time. Let's assure them that time. Here's how we'll do it. Verse 23, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So first off, you're going to go do the things I asked you to do all along. I asked you to till and keep the Garden of Eden. Well, now you're going to till and keep a, a much larger garden, the earth itself. But work. Step into that blessing slash curse that I just mentioned. Just live. In fact, it's interesting when it talks about, we saw that earlier in the thistles and the thorns and the bread and the sweat and everything else, to till the dust because thou art dust. You came from it, dust thou art, to dust thou shalt return. I love that thought of work with whatever you're made of. It's one thing to plow the soil, but it's another thing to plow the soul. And just like you're out there working in the dirt, oh, you really need to work in the dust from which you're made. Learn to conquer it. Learn to subdue the flesh. Learn to put off the natural man and become a saint through the atonement of Christ. Learn to bring growth and beauty and life out of the dust that you are made of. You got some tilling to do, Adam. And so Adam and Eve move forward and begin to do that. They're engaged in the work that they've been given. But then one other thing, 24. He drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword 
which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, cherubim are simply some kind of heavenly creature. And it was cherubim that were, they were carved into the wood of the door of the temple and embroidered into the fabric of the, of the veil, passing cherubim to come back into God's presence, the symbolic tree of life. A flaming sword. In the armor of God imagery, the sword is the spirit and the word. If, if fire purifies and cleanses, then picture this, this pure word of God that is saying, you can't come home this way, my son and my daughter. There's a higher, holier way. It's not backwards, it's forward. Onward and upward to atonement. And, and what I'm trying to do here is not to foreclose the possibility of your return. Anything but. I'm trying to ensure that you have time to prepare to come home in the right way. You see, all I'm doing now is closing off shortcuts. The sword is not waving back and forth saying, none shall pass. It's pointing Adam and Eve forward to pursue a life of, of labor, of work, of repentance, of redemption. You see, verse 23 was giving them something to do in the meantime. Go work. But 24 was giving them the meantime. You have time to do this. You see, if there were some way for you to to rush your way back into the Garden of Eden and partake of the fruit of the tree of life right now, it short circuits the entire plan through that shortcut. Because you jumped straight from immortality with a token nod to mortality that didn't have any time to do anything for you onto eternal life beyond. You haven't changed at all. It's like Jesus saying to the woman taken in adultery, I don't condemn you right now, but I can't forgive you right now either. You need time to change. So I'm not going to condemn. I'm not going to condone. I'm just going to tell you to go and sin no more. In a similar way, Adam and Eve, I'm not condemning nor condoning. I'm, I'm carving out space between the beginning of a mortal life and the end of one, which then begins an eternal life. Take advantage of the time in between. You see, there's an interesting passage in Alma chapter 12. Lehi has been working us through a lot of this already. In fact, in chapter 2, that same chapter we've been quoting several times, he says this, The days of the children of men were prolonged according to the will of God, that they might repent while in the flesh. See, that's what cherubim and the flaming sword were for, to guarantee that Adam and Eve's time would be prolonged. You're going to have a space of time before you can come back to this fruit, to partake of eternal life. And that time is meant to prepare you. It's time to repent while in the flesh. So keep going with Lehi. Wherefore, their state became a state of probation, and their time was lengthened according to the commandments which the Lord God gave unto the children of men. Now, if there was ever a good student of Lehi, it's Alma. Because when Alma and Amulek go to Ammonihah to preach, so much of what Alma teaches in chapter 12 are things that Lehi taught back in 2 Nephi 2, including this one. See, it's fascinating. He's talked about, he and Amulek have talked about resurrection and eternal life on the other side. And this ruler among the people, whose name is Antiona, raises his hand and says, wait, 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 wait. You keep talking about this eternal life, but if I remember my story correctly, in the Garden of Eden, after Adam and Eve partook of the fruit, they were cast out of the garden. God placed cherubim and the flaming sword there to keep them from eating the fruit of the tree of life so they couldn't live forever. So based on my read of, of that narrative, eternal life is not an option for us. Now, pretty insightful scripture study on Antiona's part. But Alma's response is, is glorious. He says, oh, good question. In fact, it's one I was hoping someone would raise because there's an answer I need you all to understand. And Alma answers it this way. There was a space granted unto man in which he might repent. Therefore, this life became a probationary state. Sound like what Lehi just taught? A time to prepare to meet God. It's one of my favorite things about Alma. Every time she brings up uh, probation, he, he changes it to preparation because it sounds better. It's a softer, truer term. God is not some angry probation officer looking for you to slip up so he can throw you back in prison. He is a kind coach, a helpful mentor that's trying to help you prepare for better things. And so Cherubim stands there forcing time upon us. Don't short circuit the system. Take advantage of time. Use your preparatory state. 
It's like this. God is saying, I, I must keep my word. And my word was warning you that in the day thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. And so you will die. In fact, you'll die today in terms of spiritual death. You'll be cast out of the Garden of Eden today. And physical death, well, if a thousand years with man is a day with God, Adam lived to be 930, so yeah, today, in my, in my view, you'll die today physically as well. But the idea here is I'll keep my word, you will die, just not yet. Because I also need to keep my plan, which was to bring you immortality and eternal life, but not yet there either. You need to die, but not yet. You need to have eternal life, but not yet. So what's happening? I need to carve out space between these two trees. They're placed in opposition to another. One starts the clock ticking, the clock of mortality. The other starts the clock of immortality. But in doing so, it stops the clock of mortality. There has to be a beginning and an end to this mortal probation, better said, this mortal preparation. If you want to dig into this deeper, then go back to the lesson on Alma chapter 12, the year we studied the Book of Mormon. Uh, we go into that at length. But it's amazing to see the purpose of these two trees, both necessary for God's eternal plan. But cherubim and the flaming sword making sure that time has its time to perform its saving work. Uh, remember what James says, let patience have her perfect work. Chairman the Flaming Sword were, were ensuring that. Adam and Eve, we want you to come home the right way. And now is not the right time. So go and work at it and repent of your sins. Now, Adam and Eve are going to move forward in life. And in chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, we see the birth of Cain and Abel. But this is another instance where it is such a blessing to see what God gives us in addition to that in the book of Moses. And here's why. Back in Alma 12, when he says, yes, there had to be time, there also had to be instruction, so they knew how to use that time well. If it's preparation, after all, I need to know how I should be preparing. And so in the midst of that chapter, Alma also says this, after God had appointed that these things should come unto man, namely death, and not yet eternal life, Behold, then he saw that it was expedient that man should know concerning the things where he, whereof he had appointed unto them. I mean, if this is going to be a test, there needs to be some instruction and preparation for the test, right? Therefore, he sent angels to converse with them, who caused men to behold of his glory. That's not all. They began from that time forth to call on his name. Therefore, God conversed with men and made known unto them the plan of redemption, which had been prepared from the foundation of the world. You see, both Lehi in 2 Nephi 2 and Alma in Alma 12 taught that a key, an essential ingredient of agency is not just choice and consequence, it also has to include instruction. If we're going to hold them to some standard, we have to teach them what the standard is. So let's fill this time for them not only with work, but also with learning. That way, faith and repentance can come as a result of all of this. They can take advantage of this prolonged time. And that's exactly what happens. You see, in the Genesis account, it just goes from being closed off from Eden, cast out of God's presence, to, well, I guess we're just going to multiply and replenish the earth now, since that's all we know to do. And when you meet Adam, uh, Cain and Abel, and then, then really all hell breaks loose. Then you see some real falling going on. But again, this is where the book of Moses, the inspired version provides such a helpful hint of what's really going on here. You see, in the Genesis account, you meet Cain and Abel in verse 1 and 2. In the Moses account, you, you don't meet Cain and Abel until verse 16 and 17, which means we have 15 beautiful verses added to the account to help us understand what's really going on. And they are so powerful. Verse 1, came to pass after I, the Lord God, had driven them out, that Adam began to till the earth to have dominion over all the beasts of the field, to eat his bread by the sweat of his brow, as I, the Lord, had commanded him. He's doing exactly as commanded. And Eve also, his wife, did labor with him. They are equal partners. They are true companions. Helps meet for one another. Verse 2, Adam knew his wife, and she bare unto him sons and daughters. So often in Hebrew, the verb to know 
is the word that's used as a use of euphemism for, for sexual intimacy. To know each other so intimately that life comes as a result. Okay, well, that verb will be important later on. So Adam knew his wife, he bare him sons and daughters, and they began to multiply and to replenish the earth. Now that doesn't include Cain and Abel yet. We're not going to meet them till verse 16 and 17. So they're... In the Genesis version, it seems like Cain's the firstborn son or firstborn child of Adam and Eve and Abel's the second. In this version, no, they're much later. And that difference is going to make a difference in just a moment. Verse 3, from that time forth, the sons and daughters of Adam began to divide two and two in the land, to till the land to ten flocks. They also begat sons and daughters. So, wow, it seems like a lot of time is passing before Cain and Abel come onto the scene. To the point that not only are Adam and Eve moving forward with the plan of God, but their children are too. And their children are working the land. Their children are they're following the examples of both Ab uh, Adam and Eve in terms of bringing life from the ground and life from the womb. By the end of verse 3, Adam and Eve have grandkids and Cain and Abel still aren't born. I mean, this is like those stereotypical jokes you hear about big LDS families that, that have a long uh, array of children where the... The oldest kids are so old that they're having kids by the time that the mom and dad are still having the youngest children. It's one of those instances where the nephew and niece can be older than their uncle or their aunt. And that seems to be what happens with Cain and Abel too. It's like, well, I'm younger than some of my nephews and nieces? That's weird. <laughs> well, regardless, look at verse 4. Adam and Eve, his wife, called upon the name of the Lord, which suggests how much they missed him having been removed from his presence. They're calling upon his name, and evidently God missed them too, because they heard the voice of the Lord from the way toward the Garden of Eden speaking unto them. They saw him not. They were shut out from his presence. But I love that, that God almost can't hold himself back. Oh, I know I can't be with you the way we were before, but can we stay in touch? Will you call on me? I want to call on you. So he responds to their prayer with revelation of his own. Verse 5, he gave unto them commandments that they should worship the Lord their God. And then notice this, and should offer the firstlings of their flocks for an offering unto the Lord. And how does Adam respond to that commandment? With immediate obedience. Adam was obedient unto the commandments of the Lord. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Because in verse 6, after many days, so we have prolonged and persistent obedience. And then an angel comes, appears to Adam and asks, Why dost thou offer sacrifices unto the Lord? And Adam responds, I don't know. I know not, save the Lord commanded me. Now, tragically, some people have accused Adam of blind obedience here. And I'll admit, he did seem to be blind to the why. But he was anything but blind to the who, and anything but blind to the consequences of not obeying that who, regardless of the reasons why he was giving them commandments. Again, of all the people that should never be accused of blindness, it's someone whose eyes were wide open after the fall. Someone who didn't pass through a veil after partaking of the fruit. So Adam knows full well the voice of God, knows the importance of obeying his commandments, is reaping the consequences of the choice that he and Eve had made in Eden. So even if I don't know the why, the who is enough for me, and I will obey. And with that prolonged obedience in the absence of full understanding, what does God eventually give him? Fuller understanding. We, we live and then we understand. We receive no witness until after the trial of our faith. Well, that's what's happening for him. But here comes the explanation, verse 7. The angel spake, saying, This thing is a similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten of the Father, which is full of grace and truth. Back in Moses 1, we learned that Jesus himself is full of grace and truth. Well, no wonder that his atonement would be as well. And these animal offerings, these firstlings of your flocks, where do you think your coat of skins came from, Adam and Eve? This is a similitude of my only begotten, my precious lamb. And he will be offered to cover, to atone for your sins. Wherefore, 
verse 8. Thou shalt do all that thou doest in the name of the Son, and thou shalt repent and call upon God in the name of the Son forevermore. Christ will do everything for you, and so fittingly, everything you do should be for him. In his name, repenting, calling upon his name. In verse 9, once he understands that, the Holy Ghost falls upon Adam and bears record of all those truths he just learned. Bears record of the Father and the Son. It says, I am the only begotten of the Father from the beginning, henceforth and forever. And then the best news Adam and Eve could have possibly heard, that as thou hast fallen, thou mayest be redeemed, and all mankind, even as many as will. You talk about good news. Adam, that space that is filled with that the time that you have now can be filled with work, but also filled with worship because it's filled with repentance and forgiveness. This is our time to prepare, and I want to be a part of that preparation. And when you fall, just get back up again. I'll dust you off, Mr. Dust of the Earth. Oh, the, the stains in your garments I will wash clean with a new coat of skins any time you come unto me and ask for one. That's what this is all for. Now, with eyes wide open to that reality, notice how Adam responds in 10 and how Eve responds in 11. I think, again, it's so indicative of the difference between men and women. And the first great commandment, the vertical male one, and the second great commandment, the horizontal female one. And yes, we're supposed to, to keep them both, okay? So men and women both take up the cross daily, both vertical and horizontal. But notice the difference. Verse 10. In that day, Adam blessed God and was filled and began to prophesy concerning all the families of the earth, his posterity. And this is what he said. Blessed be the name of God, for because of my transgression, my eyes are opened. And in this life, I shall have joy. And again, in the flesh, I shall see God. Being cast out of his presence isn't the end of feeling joy. It's not the end of seeing him. Being east of Eden isn't, isn't a permanent condemnation. It's not life on the chain gang. I can find joy here. But notice all of those eyes. <laughs> because of my transgression, my eyes are open. I shall have joy. I shall see God. We saw all those eyes in Lucifer back in Moses chapter 4. Uh, President uh, uh, Boyd K. Packer called it an eye problem. And it had nothing to do with his vision, although Prince of Darkness had some issues there too. It was the, the pronoun problem, I. Well, Adams is different because he's not trying to glory. He's not trying to usurp the throne of God. But it is interesting that it's back to him and his relationship with heaven. I'm going to be back with God. This vertical relationship can still remain intact. That's the best news ever. I can still be right with God because of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Well, how does Eve consider things as she looks horizontally to the, the effect of her choice on others? Her response in 11 is so perfect. And Eve, his wife, heard all these things and was glad, saying, were it not for our transgression, so let me give you a little, a little gentle correction, honey. Adam said, my transgression. Eve could have said, oh, technically it was mine before it was yours. But I'm not even going to mention that. Let's just go with ours from the very start, okay? Let's go with plural pronouns, honey. If it weren't for our transgression, we never should have had seed. So again, her focus is on posterity. I mean, no wonder she was drawn to the fruit of the tree. She was drawn to the fruit of the womb, that's who she was, the mother of all living. So we shouldn't have had seed. We never should have known good and evil and the joy of our redemption and the eternal life which God giveth unto all the obedient. Honestly, as much as I love Adam's response in 10, I love Eve's even better. Sorry. It's so inclusive. It's not just that we can be right with God. We can do right by others. And we collectively, all the obedient can have eternal life. We can joy in our collective redemption. Individuality and community, oh, well, there's a con set of contraries to prove. The be right and do right, the vertical, the horizontal, the male, the female, it's all coming together here. And best of all, it doesn't stop with that first generation. 
Verse 12 is key to what follows. And Adam and Eve blessed the name of God, and they made all things known unto their sons and their daughters. So those kids and grandkids we met back in the first few verses, they know. They have been taught by mom and dad, by grandma and grandpa. Can you imagine some of those family home evening lessons? Let's tell you some old stories about the Garden of Eden. Let's, let's tell you what it was like to make that gut-wrenching decision and what a relief it was when the promise of redemption came. Why do you think we offer the firstlings of our flocks? Because we know that God will do likewise with his beloved lamb. That's how we're going to come home to Eden. Oh, you, if you could only see the glories of that garden. We can't go back the shortcut way, but we will return as we come full circle through atonement. I would have loved to be one of those kids or grandkids in verse 12. And yet that's what makes verse 13 so devastating. Because it begins with Satan, who came among them saying, I am also a son of God. Sound familiar for Moses 1? As soon as Moses has this incredible experience of really understanding who he is and how to return to God, he's left to himself and Satan comes right on the, the heels of that experience, ready to nip the, the, the reality in the bud. So Satan comes. And what did Satan say to Moses? I'm a son of God. Well, he says the same thing here. I'm a son of God too. And then he commanded them saying, believe it not. And sadly, they believed it not. It's like one, one line in that passage. That's it? It didn't seem to take much convincing on Satan's part. I don't believe that. Oh, okay, we won't. Now, why was it so easy? Well, because Satan was offering them the easy way. The downward slope, that's what fall was for, rather than the upward climb to atonement. He was saying, oh, why take things on faith? You've got a whole world in front of you. Go, go take advantage of it. I mean, at least Grandpa Adam taught you how to till the earth. You can get... You can get wealthy with all of that. Now, bring forth that kind of life. We're going we're gonna to really push that to its limits later when we meet Cain and Abel. But here, don't believe in some future promise of, sa of salvation because it requires present sacrifice. And who wants to do that? All those firstlings of flocks could be yours. Yours for the taking. Yours for the using. So don't believe that. Sadly, next line, they loved Satan more than God, and men began from that time forth to be carnal, sensual, and devilish. If you had to force me to write the word fall next to one verse of Scripture to say, to pinpoint when it took place, it wouldn't be in the Garden of Eden. And it would have nothing to do with Adam and Eve. Again, that to me was a jump. This to me is the fall. Even after Adam and Eve left the garden, did they seem very fallen? Did they seem very carnal, sensual, or devilish? No. They understand. They are obeying, as they always did. They are moving forward along the plan, as they had in Eden, even when decisions were difficult. It's this next generation who, who chooses to be fallen themselves because they choose Satan instead of choosing God. Now, 14, God doesn't give up on them, and neither will Adam and Eve. The Lord God called upon men by the Holy Ghost everywhere and commanded them that they should repent. Now, notice the three ways God has been trying to teach redemption in this mortal probation. He speaks to them in his own voice, calling from the midst of the garden, getting as close as he can. He sends angels to minister unto them and to teach truth. And he gives the Holy Ghost to bear record of truth that has been taught. Here that spirit is commanding people to repent. In 15, he's promising that as many as believe in the Son and repent of their sins will be saved. Those that don't must be damned. Their progress will stop. And the words went forth out of the mouth of God in a firm decree, wherefore they must be fulfilled. Now, verse 16 is where we get back to the Genesis account. All this somehow was lost from the record. But now we meet Cain and Abel, and their timing as they come onto the scene, to me, speaks volumes of Adam's and especially Eve's faith and their resilience and their hope in the promised atonement of Jesus Christ. Because 
what have the results of their parenting been so far? I don't know if it was all of their children, but it, we don't have any record of any, any righteous exceptions to a wicked rule. It, to me, it is tragic that the first parents, their first generations seemed to, to be the opposite of what their, of what their parents intended. And yet, despite all of that, Eve doesn't have buyer's remorse over the fall. In fact, she doesn't have buyer's remorse or mother's remorse over bringing children into this fallen world. I said earlier that it was so much easier to accept the fall when it was theory instead of fact. Well, when fact was staring them in the face, they still moved forward. Well, now fact is really staring them in the face. And the facts have been primarily negative. I know what suffering is now. I know what sin is now. I've seen my children choose it. Well, do I have the courage to bring another child into this kind of world? I hear people talk about that in our day, that the world is too wicked for me to bring a child into it. Well, Adam and Eve would have felt that clearly by the time you get to verse 16. And yet, what do they do? Adam and Eve, his wife, ceased not to call upon God. They didn't lose faith in him, nor in their plan, because Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord, wherefore he may not reject his words. That last line, by the way, is missing from the Genesis account. It's simply, and she had Cain, because she got a man from the Lord. But here it's, maybe this one will be different. Hope springs eternal. Well, it sprung up when Cain was born which makes the next line all the more devastating. Eve didn't even make it through a, a whole verse with that hope intact. Because on the heels of that he may not reject his words, the verse continues, but behold, Cain hearkened not. He did reject those words. What a tragedy. In fact, the way he said it, who is the Lord that I should know him? Again, that's that same no verb in Hebrew that, def this, that describes some sense of intimacy. Now, with husband and wife, it's procreative intimacy. In knowing God, it's balancing that infinite with the intimate of truly becoming one with God in attribute, in likeness, in wanting to grow up in Him. And Cain isn't interested in that. Ah, who's the Lord? Why should I care? Why should I want to connect with Him? By the way, he's not the first to ask that question. When you look at, at Pharaoh, when he first meets Mo Moses, and Moses says, God says, let my people go. That's Pharaoh's response. Who's God? And in fact, who are you, Moses? When Abinadi goes to talk with King Noah, King Noah says, who's God? And by the way, who are you, Abinadi? When Alma preaches to the people of Ammonihah, the people of Ammonihah say, who's God? And while we're at it, who are you, Alma? And the same thing's happening here. Cain's first question, who is God? And we will see later, and why should I care about Abel, God's servant? Who's he? No brother of mine. Well, that brother comes onto the scene in verse 17. She again conceived and bare his brother Abel. Again, every time having another child is an incredible leap of faith in the face of of evidence to the contrary. Did doubt have a leg to stand on for Eve and for Adam? You better believe it did. But faith marched forward despite that. President Packer used to say that every time a child is born, the world is renewed in innocence. I love that. Because it's a parent, a set of parents, proclaiming, I still have faith in the future. They loved not their lives unto the death, Oh, I'm still moving forward in this. And here comes Abel. And thankfully, the next line, and Abel hearkened unto the voice of the Lord. Oh, finally. If, you, if any of you parents or grandparents out there are wringing your hands and wetting your pillow over children who are struggling in their faith, don't lose hope. The story's not over. God's plan is still in effect. 
there is hope and healing and wholeness ahead. I believe in a God of happy endings and new beginnings and, and keep on trying. And that's exactly what Adam and Eve are doing. And Abel lived up to that. It describes him as a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now, there's nothing wrong with tilling the ground. That was Adam's role, right? But keeper of sheep, maybe that's one thing that helped Abel stay faithful. That he was more physically engaged in the sacrifices. I'm taking care of these flocks. I am offering the firstlings. Mom and Dad, I trust what you taught me about this promised Lamb of God. I believe that, that he will be sacrificed for our, our salvation. And so I will make those sacrifices myself in similitude of that promise. Now, verse 18, Cain loved Satan more than God, like some of his brothers and sisters before him, like some of his nephews and nieces before him. And Satan commanded him, saying, Make an offering unto the Lord. Now, it's interesting that Satan would be behind this. Does Satan ever tell us to do something right? Well, if he can get something wrong out of it, then yeah, he'll risk that. And in this case, if I can get Cain to offer a sacrifice, but to do it in the wrong way or in the wrong motive, hmm, then that's the kind God can't accept. And once God rejects Cain's sacrifice, perhaps Cain will feel rejected himself and then reject God even further in return. Mm, sounds like a good plan. And that's exactly what, what happens. In verse 19, in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. So in process of time, did it take a while to, to beat down Cain's defenses? I don't know. Uh, did it come in process of time until Cain brought himself to this state of full rejection of the teachings of his parents and the plan of his father in heaven? Because he brings for a sacrifice the fruit of the ground. Now, I've had students in the past that say, so is that what was wrong with it? It was just like dirty fruit that had fallen to the ground. He just kind of scooped it up and said, here you go, mom and dad. Well, not quite. It's something worse than that. And, and, and the fact that it was, was fruit of the ground, it's interesting because later in the Old Testament, there will be all kinds of different sacrifices and sin offerings and burnt offerings and wave offerings and heave offerings and drink offerings and, and, and not just first liens, but also first fruits. You see, it was the sacrificial offerings that allowed the priests and their families to survive day to day, since they weren't given land to, to till or flocks to care for. Uh, that was other people. They had to live on uh, and hope that people would, be, would live the gospel so that they could live physically. Well, that is in the future. Right here, the only kind of sacrifice that has been revealed is the offering of the firstling of the flock. And why? Because that's the most perfect similitude of the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It involves the shedding of blood, the death of that first lane. And giving fruit doesn't do that. The, the land will just keep producing. The trees will keep bearing fruit. I mean, yeah, it's a sacrifice, but it's not, it's not a life and death one. It shows, and this is what Joseph Smith explained, what was wrong with Cain's sacrifice is it showed no faith, and where there's no faith, there is sin. And so this faithless sacrifice, it's as if Cain was throwing it in the face of his parents, saying, you want sacrifice? Fine. Take some fruit. Take some grain. Take what I grow. Am I not as good as my little brother with his precious flocks? Or better yet, take what I give you because I have no faith in some future promise of a Lamb of God that's going to sacrifice his life and shed his blood for us. I'm not buying it, Mom and Dad. And so I'm not giving it. I will not offer sacrifice in similitude of that because I don't believe in that. Now that is rejection. That is rebellion. Especially in the face of what these parents who knew with a perfect knowledge had been teaching since the beginning of chapter 5. Well, what happens here? Verse 20, Abel brought of the firstling of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Of course, because Abel had respect for God and his offering. You are giving me your own. I will give you my own. You are shedding blood. I will do the same. 
I understand the symbolism and I have faith in it. Meanwhile, 21, unto Cain and to his offering, God had not respect. Now Satan knew this and it pleased him. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Oh, you want to talk about sick and twisted that Lucifer rejoices in our sorrow, in our anger. When, when we feel those negative emotions, it causes him positive emotions. That's the, the opposite of compassion. Now, verse 22, the Lord says to Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is thy, thy countenance fallen? Why, why are you surprised by this? He says in 23, If thou doest well, thou shalt be accepted. You know that. Watch your brother. Watch your parents. And yet you also know this, If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. It's right outside. If you stay within the household of faith, sin can't come to you, but it's right outside. And if you will leave the confines of covenant, if you'll leave the protective embrace of my home, the household of faith, sin lieth at the door. Satan desireth to have thee. And except thou shalt hearken unto my commandments, I will deliver thee up. I can't have power when you leave my presence. And it shall be unto thee according to his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Similar language to what we saw with Adam and Eve. Desire and ruling. But this time, this odd couple is Cain and Lucifer. They seem to be cut from similar cloth. Verse 24. From this time forth thou shalt be the father of his lies. He's where they come from, but you are the one that will pass them on to subsequent generations. Thou shalt be called perdition, not just son of perdition. You're joining him as perdition itself because you know better. Thou wast before the world. In 25, it shall be said in time to come that these abominations were had from Cain, for he rejected the greater counsel which was had from God. And this is a cursing which I will put upon thee, except thou repent. Now, good news at the end. You can still repent, Cain. That's all it takes. Why do you think I've been offering these firstlings? Because... The death of Jesus Christ makes that possible even for you. It's not too late. But if you hearken not, if you refuse to repent, then you will be known forever after as the mortal source of these falsehoods. They will speak of these as the, the abominations that were had from Cain, and so it would be. In the book of Helaman, for example, it talks about the Gadiant and robbers. We'll see some secret combinations here in just a moment. But when it talks about who, play, who, how, who inspired these secret combinations, these false oaths and covenants, and that's where the book of Helaman clarifies, it comes from the same being that beguiled our first parents, or more accurately here, that same being who did plot with Cain that if he would murder his brother Abel, it should not be known unto the world. And he did plot with Cain and his followers from that time forth. And that's the story you see in the next few verses. You see, he's given the chance to repent at the end of 25, but at the beginning of 26, Cain's just more angry than ever. He was wroth. He listened not any more to the voice of the Lord, who's he, neither to Abel, his brother, who walked in holiness before the Lord, so who's he, same inability or, in, I would say, unwillingness to come to know God or his servants. Verse 27, Adam and his wife mourned before the Lord because of Cain and his brethren. These are their children after all. Well, Cain then takes one of his brother's daughters to wife, and they loved Satan more than God. Well, if light cleaveth to light, then sure darkness cleaves to darkness. And then 29, here comes this original secret combination. Satan said to Cain, Swear unto me by thy throat, and if thou tell it, thou shalt die. And swear thy brethren by their heads, and by the living God, that they tell it not. For if they tell it, they shall surely die, and this, that thy father may not know it. And this day I will deliver thy brother Abel into thine hands. Now that's where you get the secret, in secret combination. No one's ever going to know about this, which is such a brutal act of deception, since here we are, 6,000 years later, still reading about it. Everybody knows. And yet there Cain is rejoicing in verse 31, that I am the master of this great secret. And what's the secret? Well, here's the combination. I can murder and get gain, and no one will know. That was the secret combinations among the Gadianton robbers. Here's the origin of it. 
there will be secrecy, there will be threat of punishment if you ever divulge. Uh, it's almost being trapped within gangs, for example, and there's no escaping. Uh, what's the point and purpose of it? To use violence or the threats of violence to get what we want, which in this case is temporal gain. In this case, it has to do with Abel's flocks. Among the Gaddy Anton robbers, it had to do with all kinds of other things. And in our day, the secret combinations that still exist are still out to murder and get gain, to power and prestige and prominence, popularity, prosperity. Well, verse 32, Cain goes out into the field. He talks with Abel, his brother. It came to pass that while they were in the field, Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Notice every time that Abel is mentioned, his relationship to Cain is mentioned too. That's your brother. That's your brother. But Cain didn't care. He rose up and slew him. And then 33, Cain gloried in that which he had done, saying, I am free. And never was he in greater bondage. Surely the flocks of my brother falleth into my hands. And yet something was about to fall, and that was Cain. In fact, notice verse 34. The Lord says to Cain, so his secret didn't last for long. Where is Abel, thy brother? Again, plain stupid, giving Cain a chance to confess. He doesn't. He says, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Interesting word there. When Adam and Eve were first told to dress and till and keep the Garden of Eden, same word. When cherubim and the flaming sword were placed to keep the way of the tree of life, same word. Here, can you not keep, can you not guard, can you not protect your own brother? And even if you can't be your brother's keeper, could you at least be your brother's brother? How could you do this? In 35, the Lord says, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. And then, Thou shalt be cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Now remember, the earth was cursed for Adam's sake. With enough labor, it will bring forth life for you. Well, now the earth is cursed, and it's not for Cain's sake. It's to his punishment. It will not yield fruit and grain like it would for your father, like it had for you. In 37, when thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. As a result, a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Because if you can't grow crops, you can't stay settled. A farm won't work for you. So a, a situated place, you're going to be wandering, fugitive, vagabond, just trying to make ends meet. In 38, Cain tries to pass the buck. Satan tempted me because of my brother's flocks. I was wroth also because his offering thou didst accept and not mine. My punishment is greater than I can bear. This is Satan's fault. This is your fault. You wouldn't accept what I gave you. No, this is... Cain, there is accountability to go along with your agency. 39, behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the Lord. Oh, no, actually, you drove yourself away. I promised and offered repentance earlier. But now you've gone too far. From thy face shall I be hid, Cain says. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that he that findeth me will slay me because of mine iniquities. For these things are not hid from the Lord. Again, no secret in this secret combination. Well, the Lord responds to him in verse 40, that whoever slayeth thee, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And I, the Lord, set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Now, unfortunately, throughout history, this idea of a curse on Cain and a mark on Cain has been used, misused, I should say, to justify slavery of Africans. This has nothing to do with skin color. There's no evidence of that here. Uh, it has nothing to do with Africa. There's no evidence of this here either. It's just people that wanted to do that anyway are searching for biblical justification, resting the scriptures to their own destruction. And so they come up with this so-called curse of Cain. And later they'll use the same uh, thinking for the so-called curse of Ham. And sadly, there have been times even in church history where church leaders who were raised on that misunderstanding of scripture through their Protestant upbringing came to the table with that same misunderstanding. And 
and feeling for whatever reason that there needed to be a restriction on priesthood for African Americans, decided to restrict priesthood and to sometimes use Cain and or Ham as justification too. We talked about that a few weeks ago when we discussed the second official declaration. But here's the verse that is sometimes taken as, as rationalization for it. And yet, surprisingly, the mark placed on Cain was to protect him. It was almost to offset the curse, to allow the curse to have its time. Just like cherubim was to give Adam and Eve and their posterity time to repent. Well, this perhaps, is it time for Cain to re recognize and realize what he's done? and what the consequences of his decision will be? Well, he never did repent. As you go through the next few verses, it's interesting that Cain continues to have children. He ends up having a son named Enoch, and that Enoch builds a city. Verse 42 is fascinating because it's this counterfeit for the city of Zion that a real Enoch would later build. Uh, Enoch from the descendants of, of Seth, which was Abel's replacement. And we'll see that more next week. The interesting thing here is, again, this counterfeit city of Enoch. It's the opposite of Zion. If Zion is one heart and one mind, well, where's the unity where you would become your brother's keeper? There was none of that on Cain's side. What about dwelling in righteousness? Oh, no, he preferred the secret combination. And no poor among them? Oh, hardly. This was a matter of impoverishing someone else of both life and livelihood in order to enrich himself. Cain and his posterity, Enoch and that city, is a false Zion. We're watching counterfeiting taking place all throughout. Well, father to son, father to son goes on. The next big name you meet is a man named Lamech, who is still part of, of Cain's posterity, and in some ways becomes a second Cain. If Seth is a second Ab Abel, then Lamech is a second Cain. He also engages in the same secret combination. He also wants to, to get gain. He also ends up murdering. He's also involved in, in secrecy to the point that he tells, he, he has two wives and he tells them both that no one can know. He revels in his iniquity and, but tries to keep it in darkness. We see that in verse 51. For from the days of Cain there was a secret combination and their works were in the dark. And they knew every man his brother. Now that's a tough one because when it uses that word know, hmm, which kind of intimacy are we talking about? Some have interpreted that verse to, be, to speak of homosexuality, that this secret combination, they knew, the men knew their brothers in, a, in an intimate way. But it, could all, it doesn't necessarily have to be that. It could also simply be that secret combination. We know each other in this, in this secret intimacy of I'll never divulge your sins if you don't divulge mine. We don't, we don't know which one is being described here. But one interesting thing about it is what they're doing begins to spread throughout the sons of men, according to verse 52. But notice the last line. It was among the sons of men. He says that twice, emphatically. And then by way of differentiation, 53, and among the daughters of men, these things were not spoken. Hmm. So this is gender-specific sin. That some, for some reason, these particular secret combinations, this, these particular, particular actions of evil, were confined to, to, the, to the males and not among the females. And it's interesting that the wives of Lamech had a part to play in all of that. The end of 53 is fascinating. Uh, among the daughters of men, these things were not spoken because that Lamech had spoken the secret unto his wives. And they rebelled against him and declared these things abroad and had not compassion. I love that language. This is rebellion in the face of rebellion. And so this is two wrongs making a right. If you rebel against a rebel, then I guess you're on the right side again. And these wives of Lamech are exactly that. Better yet, they declare these things abroad. No better way to burst a secret combination than to tell the secret and to expose it, to expose this darkness to the light of day, where people have to, to fess up to their sins. It, it's known now. If you won't confess, then I will expose. And that's what these righteous women end up doing. And the last line, they had not compassion. 
That seems like a negative thing. In this case, this is a negative compassion that they didn't have. This is a counterfeit compassion. We could call that enabling someone. This could be called codependency in our day. This could be the victims of abuse that will never rat out their abusers, that will not expose evil even when they know it and even when they're being destroyed by it themselves. No, that is a false compassion. And the more truly compassionate thing would, to do would be to call attention to these sins in hopes that the guilty parties would change. Well, these people didn't change. And as a result, 55, thus the works of darkness began to prevail among all the sons of men. 55 is a tragic end of this chapter, but thankfully it's not quite over yet. 56, the wickedness continues. God cursed the earth with a sore curse and was angry with the wicked, with all the sons of men whom he had made. Why? 57, because they wouldn't hearken to his voice. Nor believe on his only begotten son, no faith in that sacrifice of similitude. Even him whom he declared should come in the meridian of time who was prepared from before the foundation of the world. 55, 6, 7, that's the tragic side. But 58 and 59 end on a better note. Because you still have Adam and Eve still crying repentance. You still have firstlings of the flocks being offered as sacrifice because people still have faith in the promised Son of God. So sure enough, 58, thus the gospel began to be preached from the beginning, being declared by holy angels sent forth from the presence of God and by his own voice and by the gift of the Holy Ghost. Those were the three sources of truth that we saw earlier in this chapter. God speaking from the garden, angels ministering unto men, and the Holy Ghost coming to confirm truth upon anyone worthy of his companionship. Verse 59, And thus all things were confirmed unto Adam by an holy ordinance, which would have been the ordinance of sacrifice. That's confirmation. That all these things are true. That there is still hope ahead. The gospel was preached. The decree was sent forth that it should be in the world until the end thereof. And thus it was. Amen. We have to end our conversation about the fall with a reminder of the atonement. Like I said, creation was last week, fall is this week. Atonement is everything yet to come. Even that famous verse in 2 Nephi 2, Adam fell that men might be and men are that they might have joy. I wish we would keep reading because what is the next verse? And the Messiah cometh in the fullness of time that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. Anytime you think fall, think atonement in the same breath. Adam did. Eve did. Wayward child after wayward child, Eve still held on to hope. She lost two sons that day. She lost Abel physically. She lost Cain spiritually. But she never lost hope or faith in Christ. And pretty soon, yet another son came, Seth. And the express image of his father, Adam, who was in the image of his father, God, we're trying again. And we have faith to move forward. Eve and Adam always had that kind of faith. I want to end our discussion today with two masterpieces of art. One shows two women facing each other, surrounded by trees and fruit. The woman on the left is Eve. The woman on the right is Mary. And as they're facing each other, surrounded by symbolism, Eve with this tree of knowledge of good and evil, and Mary with the tree of life. Again, in many ways, she was that tree, bearing the fruit of her womb, which evidenced the love of God. Remember, that was the angel's explanation. Do you understand condescension? No, I just want to see the tree. Fine, let me kill two birds with one stone. Let me show you Christmas. Let me show you Mary. Now, in this painting, wrapped around the feet of Eve is the serpent that beguiled her. Still clutched in one hand is the forbidden fruit. As Eve looks down, 
probably pressed under the weight of sorrow for the consequences that would not come unto her, but would come upon humanity, her posterity. But where's her other hand? Mary is clasping it and holding it against her own womb, as this handmaid of the Lord is great with child. With the other hand, she cradles Eve's head, as if to comfort her. It's going to be okay, because although the serpent is entwined around your feet, look for its head. It's crushed under mine. Oh, it may bruise a heel or two, but its, hand, its head will be crushed by the fruit of my womb. It's as if Mother Mary is saying to Mother Eve, all will be well. As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all made alive. Or put in a more soprano register. As in Eve all die, so in Mary shall all be made alive. That was the courage and faith that Eve and Adam had in the Garden of Eden. Which then makes me think of the second masterpiece I want to show you. This one came from a student of mine, Kylie who's an incredible artist. Her sister Jessica was an incredible musician. And between the two of them and their angel mother, I got to teach them at Institute, this tiny little class we had at Westminster College in Salt Lake City. It was a class on women in the scriptures and we learned discipleship from God's daughters throughout scriptures. It was a glorious experience. And at the end of that semester, Kylie gave me a gift. It was this painting that I want to show to you. I kept telling her, I can't accept this. This is way too much work. And she said, well, it's, it just re represents what I learned this semester. I, the things that we learn from Mother Eve, for example, I just wanted to put onto canvas. And I want you to have it. I want to show you the making of this masterpiece. Thankfully, Kylie created a time-lapse video of her creating this work of art. And the music in the background was composed by her sister, Jessica. These are two celestial sister saints, daughters of glorious Mother Eve, that, that bear witness that her hope was not in vain, that her faith to move forward, despite the loss of so many of her own posterity, was worth the sacrifice and struggle. Now, I'll let Kylie provide the caption. She said, Thanks to modern scripture, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has a slightly different view of Eve than many in the world today. Again, my, my son was wrong. Eve did not do a bad thing. We believe Eve was one of the noblest and greatest women to ever live, and her conflict in the garden was more of a struggle than we sometimes realize. I personally believe that her decision to partake of the fruit was something she wrestled with for a long time before Lucifer provided the tipping point. But Eve's transgression had been part of God's plan all along. In the end, it was Satan who was truly beguiled. In the ultimate act of motherhood, Eve placed literally everyone else's well-being above her own. She sacrificed the ease, beauty, and immortality of Eden for a cursed world full of sickness, sin, uncertainty, death, and all manner of trials. She did this so that each of us had the opportunity to be born and ultimately return to our Father in heaven. In my opinion, this was one of the greatest sacrifices of all time, perhaps second only to the atonement of Jesus Christ. Our Savior willingly chose to suffer and die so that each of us could live. Without diminishing what he did for us, Eve also made the choice to suffer and die so that each of us could live. And so did Adam. What transpired in the Garden of Eden was a great foreshadowing for what would eventually happen in the Garden of Gethsemane. Throughout the ages, there has too often been an air of foolishness or even depravity in the way Eve was depicted in art. Because of that, I wanted to do something a little different, to portray her conflict, her wrestle, her fear of the unknown, her goodness and her strength. I painted her with her back toward Lucifer, portrayed here by a serpent, and her eyes toward the light. I see this as almost a prayer this was the moment she realized there really was no other way to keep God's first commandment. 
In order to multiply and replenish the earth, she would have to officially claim her agency by transgressing a lesser law. This painting still hangs in my office at the Institute. And I look at that and see not only the courage of Eve, but the strength of so many of her daughters. My friends, I bear testimony that the fall was a fortunate step forward along progression's highway. I pray that we can navigate whatever path lies ahead and go onward and upward to the atonement. I testify that waiting at the end is not cherubim and a flaming sword keeping the way of the tree of life, but rather the gardener of Gethsemane himself beckoning us to come home. Whatever fruit of knowledge you may have already partaken of, the fruit of God's life and love is sweet above all that is sweet, pure above all that is pure. It is more desirable than any other fruit.